Sup, my fellas, don't forget to leave feedback and enjoy the story. It is the year 2047. Green energy emanates from a portal with tentacles hanging in the sky above the city. Twenty-five years have passed since portals known as the Gates of Hell began to open worldwide. Humanity is extinct and the world has changed. Huge monsters prowl the ruins of the city. There was only one survivor. A man in a raincoat is silhouetted in front of them. He has a hood over his face and is wearing steel armor shaped like a skull. He has a monster's head in his hand. Nothing is visible under the hood. A man traverses a crumbling stone floor. He is missing his little finger. He has gray hair and is dressed in a beat-up brown coat. He peered intently ahead. He has a gray beard and mustache and his face is scarred and lined. He was standing in front of the armored man when lightning struck and the man swung his sword and drove it into the ground. He went to one knee, bowed his head, and extended his hand to grasp the monster's head. In front of him stands an elderly man. Calmly, he studied the broken bar sign. The man picked up a bottle of wine. The voice said that as soon as he began sipping from the bottle, he recalled hearing tales of a man who exclusively hunted demons with large eyes. He inquired as to what it meant and who would have believed them to be true. It was too long to discuss, the man said, wiping his mouth with his hand. He promised to find out quickly. The man in armor unlocked the doors. The eyes of the severed head glowed, asking if that task was indeed real. In response, the man said it was true. There are numerous enraged monster heads hanging on the wall. A man clad in armor made his way toward the monster head shelves. The man claimed that the ability to shake the timeline and travel back in time would belong to the person who gathered more than 666,666 elite demon heads after humanity vanished. The head of the monster gave him a serious look. The man claimed to be the final one. When he placed his head on the shelf, it began to swear and questioned whether he was crazy. The head asked him if he believed he could go back in time and alter the future to make a difference. In a composed response, the man said he would see his daughter. The head realized with a start that he was just doing this for fun. With a dagger, the man stabbed the monster between the eyes and its head. He grimly stated that this was the only reason he had lived through this hell for 25 years. A purple light flared beneath his hand. He was warned by the monster not to expect them to do nothing but watch. The man inquired as to whether he was discussing phases. The monster had a purple glow emanating from its forehead. The man scowled and said that they were the ones who created this task, opened the portal, and transformed this world into hell. Legendary quest is stated in the dialogue box. You satisfy every requirement for regression. There was a purple energy surrounding the man. Even they, he claimed, are not all-knowing. With their mouths wide open, the monster's eye sockets emitted a brilliant purple light. The man's fists were clenched as he stood. According to the dialogue box, it gathered the 666,666 heads needed for regression. The creature's head was full of fractures and had a purple glow to it. The man claimed that the phases didn't concern him. You are the only survivor on Earth, the dialogue box informs you. The pink energy spiral glowed brightly. Gritting his teeth, the man threatened to kill anyone who got in his way. When the dialogue box displays task completed, the nexus is activated. A brilliant pillar of energy leaped into the building from the sky. A blue energy pillar shot out from the collapsed structure. A yellow energy pillar struck the structure. A blue-eyed, dark-haired man is sitting up in bed. He turned to face his hands. After that, he looked up through the window. He ran for the door, his face furrowed. Glancing out the door, he summoned someone. The boy stood in front of a small child who was tucked into bed with a newborn blanket. Dragons soar above the engulfed, burnt city. The main character is standing over the city street, holding his daughter's hand. Her eyes were filled with tears as she cried out to him. The main character found it difficult to move his left arm and believed that his right arm was broken. There are two arrows protruding from his blood-covered left arm. In his mind, he prayed to God, requesting that at least his daughter be saved and expressing that he didn't care if he died. The protagonist clenched his jaw. Under his daughter's feet, the monster's enormous mouth opened. Her gaze lowered. The protagonist let out a scream. From the monster's mouth, the girl called out while extending her other hand. The girl's hand was still gripping the protagonist's arm when the monster's jaws closed. The protagonist brought his daughter's hand up to his face and held her palm in both of his hands. He started to cry and tremble. Slowly, someone opened her eyes. The main character shut the door behind her and hurried out of her room. Surprised, the girl sat up in bed and called out to him. The main character had his back to the door as he stood outside of it. He dropped to one knee. He started crying as he thanked God. He opened his eyes and looked forward, frowning. He believed that he was aware that this joy would not last forever. He recalled the opening of the green gate above the city, visible through the clouds. The main character believed that the world would drastically alter the day the gates of hell open. He looks intently into the ajar refrigerator. The protagonist sipped water from a bottle. 
He thought about how he had lived only for himself for the previous 25 years. Throwing the empty bottle into the sink, he did so. If someone could protect Summon and survive this hell, the main character questioned. He said, biting his lip, that he shouldn't consider the odds. He took a quick peek at the Summon's room door. She was sound asleep in her bed. The main character felt obligated to keep her safe. He straightened up and gazed straight ahead. With a frown, he declared he would defend her to the end of his life. The dialogue boxes state that you have been bestowed magical abilities. You've been given spiritual magic at a beginner level. Spirit eyes at the first level turned on. The main character turned to look at his glowing blue hand and was taken aback. He noticed with a raised eyebrow that he still had strength. You have been given entry-level spiritual magic, the dialogue box states. He widely opened his eyes. The dialogue box indicates that it's being observed by the spirit. The protagonist peered at the bookcase. A picture of a contented mother holding a child was there. Did it ask if it was Sua? An image of a woman in a light blue hugged the main character from behind. He pondered why he was still able to use his powers. He slipped his coat on. The main character proposed that either this was a result of a time travel or a regressor's ability. The primary character is clad in a long coat and is standing. The gates of hell will open on October 11th, which is three days away. A massive red eye is visible in the sky above the group of monsters below. There are people who are aware of the gate's existence three days before it opens. Eight martial stars are the eight prophets selected by the eight phases. The extraordinarily quick-moving chosen ones who would save humanity. The main character believed that he would be able to intercept many accomplishments and rewards that were exclusive to them because of what he remembered from the last 25 years of his life. City Street at Night the primary character is positioned in front of the underground descent. He declared that he would keep everything for himself while glancing toward the stairs that led below. He descended into the tunnel beneath the surface. The protagonist strolls along it, surveying his surroundings. He turned to the side and saw a compatibility of name sign and fortune teller. He entered and carefully opened the door. His expression was serious as he looked ahead. It was odd, someone in the dark commented, since nobody was supposed to be here today. Grinning, he questioned how anyone could have arrived. In response, the main character said that it sounded as though he wasn't prepared for a visitor. What brought him here was questioned by an old man in shorts who was seated in a chair. In response, the main character called him Yaksha and said he had come to buy something. He was thrown against the wall by a massive hand that grabbed him. The main character gritted his teeth and looked forward. In the dust cloud, the hand's owner was invisible. The protagonist scowled. The boot-wearing man approached him. The main character was being held above the ground by the shadowy figure of a horned man. Yaksha questioned who he was angrily. In response, the main character stated that he understood what they were doing and that he wished to pass the prophet's test. If he was correct, he inquired. Yaksha inquired as to who might have informed him of this location. He said, narrowing his eyes, that it was not possible because the selection process was still ongoing, as they had stated from above. With a composed response, the main character stated that it was true and the reason he was there. He explained that he came early because he wanted to take the selected person's place. Shaksha left. The hall reverberated with his laughter, smirking. He inquired as to whether he was the regressor who vanquished 666,666 elite demons, the subject of much discussion. If he thought they wouldn't find out, he inquired. Yaksha stated that they are aware of everything and that he has disrupted the timeline. He said he was in serious trouble, holding up his index finger. Smiling, he asked if he had decided that regression would allow him to do anything he wanted. With a vicious narrowing of his eyes, Yaksha declared that he would only anger the higher phases by mixing up the cards on this chessboard they had made. He was told to take his hand off because it stank by the main character. Three swords struck Yaksha in the arm. With a painful shout, he raised his hand and released the main character. The main character, after taking off his clothes, expressed his desire to amputate his arm, but it appears that his body is not yet prepared for this. He continued by saying that it makes sense because he currently lacks any special runes. Yaksha looked at the sword protruding from his hand and cursed. The main character corrected him, saying that this was all part of their plan and that regression was made possible by the phases. If such creatures thought anything about them, he inquired. Yaksha yelled at him to shut up while waving his hand. Something thudded. Yaksha, who has a blow mark on his cheek, stands startled. His other cheek was struck by another blow. The protagonist genuinely questioned whether he really needed the head for decoration. He inquired as to whether he knew what it meant to be a regressionist. Shaking, Yaksha kneels before the main character. He was informed by the main character that this indicates he has met the requirement. Yaksha flinched when he saw his hand lowered. According to the main character, he had defeated 666,666 elite demons. Although Yaksha believed that the Yaksha race thrives on the anxieties of other animals, he is now terrified. His alarming eyes grew wide. 
He shrank to a tiny size and shouted that he was weak by waving his arms. The lead character smiled happily. He said he needed to tell Yaksha two things while holding up two fingers. He informed him that the first was that it would be forbidden for members of his race to kill humans prior to the opening of the Hell Gate. He continued by saying that the second was that Yaksha was in possession of a specific bundle, which was the reason he was searching for it. Shaksha asked about the bundle after being startled. He was advised not to even consider attempting to murder him when the Hell Gate opened by the main character. He referred to it as the second rank Yaksha cure. Incredulous, the curate questioned how he knew his true name. The protagonist said, beaming, they are very close to him. Kira's mouth dropped open in shock and panic. He believed it was impossible. Whether he meant to imply that he was his servant or something, he asked in disapproval. The protagonist scowled. Kira looked at him in shock and gave up. There was a sack tied with red rope above the arms out cursed figure of Cure. The rope pulled free from the knot, allowing the bag to open. With composure, the main character turned to the side. His eyes lingered on the dialogue box before him. After some consideration, he concluded that this was the proper course of action. He believed it to be a storefront set aside for business. 4608, the dialogue box stated, Robust steel helmet, position, magic, pinnacle, very strong shield, made from an old oak and a metal alloy. 300,000 heads were paid. Quantity 230. The Sword of Sunstar. Rank, Relic, Uncommon. The chief of the celestial beings credited this sword with having the power to slice stars. The owner's abilities determine how much more power the sword can hold. Possess a keen tongue. It speaks without ceasing. One million dollars in headcount. Digit 5147. The Staff of Emerald. Position, Magic, Pinnacle. The Emerald Ball within lets you see your magical abilities. The cost is 400,000 heads. The main character believed that they were insane and that each monster was getting one head. There would be nothing he could ever purchase. He concluded that a million heads would be a minor alteration for him in the future. Tyr questioned him about what he had been staring at all this time. He claimed he wouldn't be able to purchase anything and that he didn't even really have any means of getting the heads. The protagonist gestured toward the dialogue box with his finger. Telling him to give it to him, he pointed a finger at himself. They silently kept staring at one another. Tyr called him crazy and inquired as to how he could give him this. If he could read, he inquired. 394,810, the dialogue box says, the scroll of Yaksha, relic, rank, and magic. One of the eight major races, the Yaksha, is represented by the scroll, able to capture and preserve a vast amount of data. You have the ability to alter the recorded content with the power of Yaksha. The items on the list still require redemption. 80,000 head price. Note, if you are friendly with Yaksha, you may receive a gift from him. Pure yelled about its remarks regarding friendships. He yelled, I'm hitting him with irons. He recalled the main character piercing Kira's arm three times with swords. He yelled that he was giving him a face punch. He recalled how Kira had been slapped across the face by the main character. He demanded angrily to know why in the world he should give him anything. Kira stated that he would not benefit from it. The main character put his hand on the sword's hilt. He began to take the swords from Kira's grasp. He let out a pain cry. He questioned his actions. In a composed reply, the main character said that he had taken them out for him. Which of the two was the demon, Yaksha questioned. He was thrown two bundles of money by the main character. Kira asked what it was after taking a look at the money. In response, he said that it was 20 million won and that if he was a friend, he would give him an additional 80 million. Kira threw the money wads aside. The protagonist glanced at the cash that was tossed aside. Kira yelled that these pieces of paper would be worthless in three days, something he knew full well. The protagonist shot him a chilly glance and assured him that they would come in handy. He claimed that the money would save his life on a pitch black night two years later. Pure questioned his topic of discussion. The main character advised him to think that he is far more knowledgeable about what will and won't become valuable in the near future. Even when the gate opens, money will always have a cost, he claimed. Pure cast a quick glance at the cash, questioning his sincerity. He believed that although money is everything to humans, it is just paper to them. Pure asked him if he thought he was being funny. He would have to take him at his word, the main character said. Kira screamed and blood spurted out. The protagonist declared that even if he wanted to, he could not listen to him before throwing the dagger from his grasp. He stated that all he knew was that the cure, due to her refusal, would involve biting her elbows in two years, but by then it would be too late. Kira, his teeth clenched ferociously, declared that his anger surpassed even that of Nagi. The protagonist smiled and admitted that he was aware of it. The remedy was a tense, sweaty frown. The space twisted. Holding a scroll in his hand, the main character is standing. Kira inquired as to his plans for it. In response, he said he would document the incidents. Gathering bundles of cash off the ground was the cure. According to the main character, this will be his pass to the prophet's trials. Kira believed that he was skilled at making up words. He told him he hoped he knew what he was doing and that he'd had enough. 
His startled eyes grew wide. The protagonist's index finger made contact with the open scroll. Before him, the room broke like glass. It was time, the main character declared, for him to meet the phases. He walked among the broken pieces. His startled eyes grew wide. Remedy called out. The main character cast a furrowed gaze forward. A massive crimson eye peered down at him. The cure and the main character are strolling across a bridge that is encircled by blue lights and dark areas. Cure kept a watchful eye on the main character. When the main character turned around, he pursed his lips and averted his gaze. He gave him a nervous glance and was shocked to see that the main character was still focusing on him. He inquired as to why he was trailing him. Cure instructed him to simply go where he was going and observe how agonizing his death would be. He requested permission to ask him a question. What he wanted to know was asked by the main character. Cure, with a frown, said that he acknowledges that this is accurate and that memories from a previous life are the source of his knowledge of the prophet test and the rune language. Additionally, he acknowledged that he is currently attempting to usurp the prophet's privilege. What was next, the main character wondered. Since the prophet was the one who was meant to come here in the first place, Cure questioned him about what he intended to do with him. If he knew who it was, he inquired. He asked if he was embarrassed, saying that he was currently stealing his privilege. The protagonist scowled. C-H-W-I-H. Wisu, a dark-haired, red-eyed man with a high-collared black cloak and a bone necklace, was grinning eerily and let out a ghostly howl. As one of the eight martial stars, he is an unparalleled being. He is surrounded by monsters and zombies in a destroyed city that has a red aura around it. Ruler of a horde of monsters raised from the dead. He seems to live forever. He matched the strength of Alec, the most formidable of the eight martial stars. Choi H. Wisu puts on surgical clothes and a medical mask before putting on white gloves. Because he was a psychopath, to others he was just another piece of garbage that needed to be disposed of. The man who had his mouth taped shut was lying chained up on the table. His red eyes were filled with tears. He needed corpses as a prerequisite to use resurrected monsters. Leaning over the man on the table was Choi H. Wisu. To produce high-quality corpses, he conducted experiments on living individuals. With a menacing smile, Choi H. Wisu turned around and removed his medical mask. According to the main character, he treated him in the same way. Kira scowled and said he had no sympathy for him. He asserted that regardless of his strength in a past life, he was just an ordinary person now and that he ought to exercise greater caution. The main character believed that he already knew who he was upsetting because he had tormented him for 18 years, but he stated that if only he knew. It was an unexpected visitor, the voice said. You have entered the realm of the Lord of the Seven Snakes, the dialogue box informs you. The main character gave a serious glance up. Tyr was asked why he allowed people inside by the Lord of the Seven Snakes. His fingers were twitching. This is not the prophet that the Lord of the Seven Snakes selected, and he declared that only a prophet is permitted entry. The protagonist lifted his head and declared that his greatest error had been not selecting him. He claimed that he ought to have picked it right away. On the screen, a massive red eye emerged. Kyr yelled that he was an assassin and a regressionist who had slain 666,666 top-level demons, pointing a finger at the eye. According to the Lord of the Seven Snakes, he was the one who inverted their game board. He declared that he was unworthy of being a prophet. The protagonist scowled and advised him to investigate it on his own. He declared that he was unquestionably superior to the Cho H. Wisu he had selected. The voice stopped, and the enormous eye started to close. The main character was staring at a memory in which he was holding his daughter's hand while they were hanging over the city street. He considered how he was unable to move his left arm because of his broken right arm. His left hand has two arrows protruding from it. He prayed to God to save his daughter because he didn't think it mattered if he died. A massive monster's mouth opened beneath his daughter's feet. The girl lowered her gaze. She extended her other hand out of the monster's mouth and called out to her father. The monster's jaws snapped shut when the main character gave a loud cry, leaving the girl's hand gripping the main character's arm. The protagonist saw this scene play out multiple times and inquired as to what it was. Something blue touched their hands. The protagonist had a condescending expression. He exclaimed, Sua. The protagonist shut his eyes. The regressor who altered the timeline was a follower of the Lord of the Seven Snakes, to which he chuckled and inquired. Both the reflections on the shattered glass and the eye of the main character are visible. The main character stood behind the broken glass, his expression solemn. He dropped to one knee and asked him to hold his tongue. With a dagger in his hand, he leapt up and stabbed the enormous red eye. His mouth fell open in shock at this point. The protagonist scowled and declared that he wasn't his disciple. From the red eye, a mist of white emerged. Gritting his teeth, the main character hit the ground. According to the Lord of the Seven Snakes, it was unexpected. The protagonist rose to his feet. The Seven Snakes Lord inquired as to how he had become so powerful. The main character believed that even the most powerful being is not all-knowing. This force, he claimed, validates his regression. 
He speculated that it might be a prize for making it through this hell. A hand snapped its fingers, its nails black and sharp. A ring of purple flame surrounded the cure and the main character. The main character cast a furrowed gaze forward. With sly eyes, the Lord of the Seven Snakes gazed at him. He claimed to have questioned him about his source of power. He occupied a lofty throne. He was approached by the main character, who informed him that Choi H. He himself had received this power from his chosen prophet, Wisu. In response, the Lord of the Seven Snakes said it was fascinating. He claimed that he was incapable of imagining the regressor to be his obedient servant. The protagonist was staring at three enormous white snakes. With a sly smile, the Lord of the Seven Snakes declared that he was entitled to a conversation. He said, closing his eyes, it seems like there's someone there who killed 666,666 demons. He said that someone who watched the sun and moon was most likely the perpetrator. He continued by saying that he believed it to be a pointless feat. He expressed to him his profound emotion at having surmounted this challenge and arrived at the conclusion on his own. The main character frowned as she turned to face him. Regretfully, the Lord of the Seven Serpents stated that his choices are final and that he has already selected a prophet. He was sitting on the throne, surrounded by snakes, with one leg crossed, and a smile on his face. This is not the case, the main character said, and she inquired as to whether he was aware of the prerequisites for regression. The Seven Serpent Lord's smile vanished, and he inquired as to what he was discussing. According to the main character, this indicates that he is the only one who has survived and the person he selected has not. He declared that all other supreme beings' prophets perished before him. The main character is standing above the city's destroyed ruins. He claimed that he had come to give him a chance rather than to beg for the prophetic position. He declared that if he didn't select it, it didn't matter and he could just help the other celestial beings win. He went on to say that the first person he kills will be the prophet he selects. Chira pleaded with him to stop worrying. The Lord of the Seven Snakes asked if he was a threat, leading on the arm of the throne. With a menacing expression, he threatened to kill him right then and there. He warned him that his starting position would worsen and that he might end up a common enemy of higher existences. He questioned why he ought to pick it. Dambung retorted that he could win this game in this manner. He claimed to be aware that the rules prevented higher beings from viewing him as an enemy. Chira gave him a cold stare. Dambung claimed to have lived to witness the opening of the gates of hell, despite not knowing anything about it beforehand. The Seven Snakes Lord gave him a silent look. The protagonist grinned and predicted that he would make it through this time, pointing a thumb at himself. The Seven Snakes Lord shifted just a little. He expressed liking it. A shaft of light materialized beside Nambung. He looked up at him. Choi Yi was on the ground. Twisu, dressed in shorts and a t-shirt, was massaging his neck and inquiring as to what had transpired and his location. The protagonist identified him. Choko Yi, Twisu looked up when his name was called. His face was unshaven, and bags were visible under his eyes. He questioned why he knew his name and who he was. Blood splattered as a massive red paw crushed it. The prophet would be changed, according to the Lord of the Seven Serpents. Red Paw went back to the portal in pink. Grinning, the Lord of the Seven Snakes declared that he would pick him. The Lord of the Seven Snakes has recognized you, the dialogue box says. A blue magical seal materialized beneath the main character's feet. According to the dialogue box, you have turned into a snake prophet. Special access for prophets, teleport to the serpent vault. Nambung gave a contented smile. Serpent treasure. In front of three doors, one gold, one silver, and one bronze, stand the Lord of the Seven Snakes and Nambung. Doors poisoned by a trio. Grinning, the Lord of the Seven Snakes instructed the protagonist to take anything he desired from the bronze door, adding that he could only open it. He went on to say that when the carnival starts, the prophets will have to guide the populace. Nambung inquired as to whether or not they were celebrating the hell they were going through. With a smile, the Lord of the Seven Snakes corrected him, introducing himself as Jor. Nambung gave him a contemplative look, realizing that this was just the beginning and that he would make every effort. In front of them, the door opened. Pure shivers as she stands behind me. They were conversing as if it were normal, and he felt like his knees were trembling just by looking at it. The doors shut on his departure. He took a seat on the ground. Once more, the doors flew open. Pure was sitting on the floor, sound asleep. He opened his eyes at the sound of his name. When Nambung beckoned him to follow, he complied and stood up. They emerged from the subterranean corridor through the portal. Pure inquired about the contents. In response, the main character said he had received the item. In his hand, red-black energy was building. It states 8 in the dialogue box. The legendary helmet of King Lyric, the most haughty and greatest monarch in history. You will have enormous power, but your arrogant transgressions will cost you dearly. When a living thing uses it, their life force is depleted. The dead bestow power upon them when they use them. Pure, wearing a dejected expression, assumed he was wondering what equipment he had selected, but this equipment is completely meaningless to a living being. He questioned his decision. 
The sight of Nambung's eyes on him startled him. It was very well-tuned, he said, stuttering with nervous laughter. He was told to reveal his back by the main character. Astonished, Pure inquired about the heads. Nambung claimed to have them while holding a bag in his hands. He mentioned having 100,000 heads. Pure gave him a startled look. Asking if he had received them from the Lord of the Seven Snakes, he shouted in surprise. Nambung said he received them from Jordan. Pure claimed that even for the most basic things, when they give something, they demand an unbelievable price in return. In response, the main character said he was already aware of that. Astonished, Pure inquired about the price he had paid for 100,000 heads. He claimed not to have paid anything. He grinned and said, I guess he got paid. He claimed that by giving him 100,000 heads, Jor was concerned that he would be singled out by other prophets for being a regressor. Instead, he claimed to have given him a mission, dubbed his condition, to kill 666,666 demons, which was comparable to the regression feat. The legendary ranked quest Red Wax was written on the dialogue box next to the scroll enveloped in an orange aura. Nambung unlatched the parchment. You have received a legendary ranked quest, according to the dialogue box. The main character smirked and squinted his eyes at the scroll. The seven snake incarnations hidden quest was added, according to the dialogue box. Pure questioned what he had been given. Nambung said he told him to give him his bag and questioned why he was standing like a pillar. He caught himself and asked what she had to dig through the bag nervously. Nambung advised giving him a sword that is affordable for the number of heads he possesses. It should be at least a rare rank, he continued. Terra reported finding two, and the main character saw two dialogue boxes appear in front of him. Widow's eye is mentioned in the first, rarest to the best. The sword a noblewoman's late husband had given her. The knife has poison in it. Cost of 89,000 head. Keep in mind that her husband's cause of death is a mystery. The executioner's beheading blade appears in the second one. Rarest to the best. Swanned at the pillory over 18 to 0. The zeal of the executioner does not waver. Blood stained with resentment. 77,000 head price. Furthermore, it has the potential to turn someone into a murderous madman if not handled by a man of integrity. Nambung remarked thoughtfully that the deep stories and overly lengthy descriptions did not seem promising. All it meant, he explained, was that they were under some sort of curse. Digging into the bag, Pure concurred and explained that's why they were so inexpensive. Nambung declared that he would select this one. A black sword with a red stripe running through it was in his hand. He promised to purchase a bag for the other heads. Pure promised to give the bag to him. He was asked if he would give it to him for free by the main character. Dimwit's work belt was written on the dialogue box that was in front of it. Rank magic at the top. A belt designed for use by dwarfs with short legs during labor. Larger tools than itself can be held by it. Not able to support living things. 400,000 head price. Pure stated that it is very difficult to get rid of things that have a long history. He was holding a belt and bags in his hands. Grinning, he gave his head a quick scratch. With a sly smile, he rubbed his hands together and continued, saying that being his other self came at a far higher cost than this pitiful bag. When Nambung's sword vanished from above his hand, he inquired about the time. Three o'clock, according to Pure. Why is this place empty? The main character wondered. He mentioned that this side had a barrier. Nambung was happy that he wouldn't be late and complimented him on his excellent work. Pure, who had once again transformed into an old man, inquired as to whether he would take action once more. Since he purchased the sword, he believed that he was aware of it and that he was undoubtedly planning something. He scowled and pondered whether he should begin searching for the prophets. Nambung grinned back and said he had to go pick up his daughter. Pure gave him a startled look. As he walked away, the main character waved his hand and informed her that their classes were about to end and they would speak again later. Pure silently watched over him. Nambung and his daughter checked two days prior to the gates of hell opening. They are seated across from one another at the table. The main character is strolling down the street with his daughter, Nambung with multiple shopping bags in hand. In the room, they are engaged in a video game. Nambung is seated on the floor with a gamepad in his hand, and his daughter is standing with her foot resting on his arm. In a bed are the main character and his daughter. It was a brief period of order in an otherwise chaotic life. Salmon asked him if it was the day he mentioned as she was tying the laces on her shoes. It is true, he stated. She asked if these supplies were enough for survival while looking through her backpack and mentioned that she had paid for them with her own pocket money. Nambung questioned her belief in what he had told her. Grinning, she turned to face him and said, I believe you because I have always stood by your side. Nambung returned a small smile. He held Salmon's hand. National Cemetery of Digian. There are bodies in front of tombs. A short-haired man called the main character Captain Nam and put his hand to his head. Nambung asked him how long it had been since they were released while placing a hand on his shoulder. He said it had been a while since they had seen one another. Nambung claimed that nothing had changed and that he would be prepared to rejoin the service tomorrow if needed. The main character told him not to talk nonsense, looking down. Nambung grinned and turned to face the vending machine. 
What about salmon? He asked. She was dozing off in the car, he claimed. He concurred, stating that she was probably exhausted and that they were far from Seoul. Salmon is dozing off in the vehicle's backseat. Nambung expressed regret and said he ought to have visited them. Nambung warned him not to speak in such a manner and said that he had given her permission to sleep because the situation would not be pleasant later on. Nambung questioned whether he was referring to his face, taken aback. According to the main character, there was a purpose for them to meet here rather than in Seoul. After a brief pause, he called out to Nambung. He claimed to have a message for him. Nambung jerked as he took a sip from his beverage. Nambung turned to face him and asked if he would believe him if he told him that the end of the world was near. Surprised, Nambung spat out water. He asked, laughing, if he had come this far just to tell a joke. With a serious expression, the main character expressed his desire for it to be a joke. Nambung gave him a tense look. Suddenly the floor started to tremble. People asked what was going on after being startled. There was a shout for them to dial 119. Nambung stood up and let out a startled exclamation. He began telling the main character that they had to leave this place immediately. He paused and gave him a startled look. A sword covered in black and red energy materialized in Nambung's hand. The protagonist stood up and declared firmly that he would murder each and every one of them. Goblins were everywhere in the street, making weird noises. They were being chased by people who were screaming for assistance, running past Nambung and the main character. Nambung expressed surprise at how quickly they needed to leave this place. Nambung turned and called out to the goblins who were sprinting toward him. He turned to face him and proposed that they should make it through this time together. Multiple goblins jumped to take aim at him. Fearfully, Nambung held out his hand and yelled the name of the main character. With a single thrust of his sword, he dispatched the goblin soldiers. Nambung gaped in shock at the severed bodies of the goblins. Nambung requested that he go get some. Shocked, he inquired as to his next course of action. Nambung spun around and did it again. Nimhun nervously swallowed. His hand went to his head and he nodded in an army salute. He yelled that he would come back as he fled. The terrified woman is grabbed by the goblin's shoulder as he swings his club. Nambung used the swing of his sword to bring it down. He raised an inquiring eyebrow. There was a massive green eye visible in the sky. A vast army of goblins with clubs tipped with spikes started to drop out of it. People yelling as they fled questioned what it was. He recalled how, as his protege, Jordan had requested permission to offer him some advice. He declared, palm up, that he alone knew what would happen to the dead. He warned him that he would weigh other people's lives whenever he felt moved to save one. With a sly smile, Jordan advised him to be self-centered since this is the course that the protege of the seven snakes should take. He claimed that he would always be branded as a hypocrite, regardless of what he did. Nambung, covered in light, stands with his sword. He believed that in order to face the fate of a hypocrite one day, he would need strength. He asked if he could ask for their assistance once more in this lifetime, acknowledging that they might not remember him. He claimed to be enveloped in red energy and to be calling forth the spirits of his native land as the most powerful person on earth. He jerked open his eyes. The red light veiled the graves. Energy streams erupted from the graves. They went toward Nambung. He gritted his teeth and stood, exuding energy. According to the dialogue boxes, level 2 soul detection is now active. You connect with the friendly spirits around you. The second level soul eye is active. The protagonist's teeth were clenched tightly. The spirits of the memorial rise within you, the dialogue box says. Nambung is surrounded by a red aura. According to the dialogue boxes, soul summoning is available at level 2. The amount of souls you are able to call forth has surpassed your capacity. There are 0 out of 3 summonable spirits available. The protagonist, surrounded by a red aura, let out a calm breath. Three military-clad soldiers emerged from the earth, their auras tinged red. Their bodies were engulfed in something black, and metal masks materialized on their faces. The main character was surrounded by dead men who bent down to one knee. As the goblins attack, people flee while yelling for assistance. The human declared that there is no end to them while wearing a summon on his back. He was surrounded by goblins. He inquired about his methods of handling them on his own. He turned to face the sleeping summon and expressed his amazement at her ability to get a good night's sleep in spite of everything. He inquired as to her level of pain. Looking ahead, he was taken aback. He cursed as a massive army of goblins dropped from the sky in front of him. Leaping at Yuman, the goblins swung the club. In an instant, the dead man materialized in between them and severed the goblin's head. Yuman called out to Nambung with joy. He wanted to know who these people were and what was going on. In response, the main character said he would go into more detail later. Tell him to grab the sword, he said. What did he mean by that? He inquired, taken aback. Nambung claimed that goblin populations remained high. He claimed he could handle it and that he was a talented kendo player. Yuman hesitated before stating that he had to save lives even though he had promised his master he would never raise the sword again. He asked his master to pardon his useless disciple and apologized. With both hands gripping the sword, he yelled, Cry, Hell's Punisher. He inquired as to the sword's name. 
people shouted that they didn't want to die here as they clambered to the top of the hill in an attempt to escape the goblins. They also asked why the police weren't showing up. At the bottom, a small boy was crying, and a woman from above saw her son. The man dragged her away from the precipice, yelling that they needed to save the living, and inquired as to her destination. She yelled that her son was present and insisted on being let go. The goblin struck the weeping child with his club. The human trumpeted the goblin's head, swung his sword. With a smile, he instructed the boy to see his mother. The woman thanked him and yelled for them to take him upstairs. Nambung swung his sword and watched human kill goblins. He left his position of guiding people to him after giving it careful thought and realizing that his strength could not be shown publicly. Human of the Tyson Sword was the head of the clan of armed guardians in the protagonist's former life. Nambung believed that he would guide the group of people out of the darkness instead. With his daughter resting on his back, he stood surrounded by the dead red cloak. With their backs to each other, Human and one of the main characters engage in goblin combat. Human swore while clenching his teeth and slamming his sword into the goblin's head. Breathless, he glanced at the goblin's body and inquired as to whether it was the final one. It appeared that he could finally get some rest, he said as he sat down on the ground. Human looked surprised when he heard the loud noise and inquired as to what it was. They'd gotten rid of every goblin, he yelled. He slowly swiveled to the side. Nambung scowled, feeling that he had arrived at last. A massive goblin warrior holding a large, crude sword stood in front of him. He struck out with his sword, but Human parried the blow. With a gritted teeth, the goblin swept him off balance with a single sword swing. A crack appeared in the floor as Nambung fell to the ground. The goblin spun around and walked away. Human was approached by the main character, who assured him that he wouldn't break any bones and that everything would be alright. He stopped and asked what it was, then walked away. Nambung said he believed he was moving in the direction of the temple. He clarified that it was a location designed to accept donations for the goblin lord. He explained that the goblins intended to use the memorial tower as their base and that they would soon begin to multiply if they didn't find them. Nambung swore, claiming that the memorial tower was the object of their actions. He questioned how he came to know such details. Nambung stated that this was his second time with composure. What's the second time? Yuman asked, scratching the back of his head. Wife, the main character retorted. He hesitated to answer. Yuman gave him a forehead slap and told him he wasn't expecting any less from him. Since this was his second time, he must be really bored, he said, and advised him to finish it as soon as possible. Nambung reassured him that even after they killed the goblin warrior, the situation would not end. The goblin temple, a goblin with a hooded red robe rests majestically atop a pedestal. The main character stated that they must kill the goblin lord, the world boss, in order to foil their plan. Human claimed that he appeared as though he couldn't even withstand a blow, in contrast to the warriors, as he peered out from behind the wall. Nambung retorted that the warriors obey him because he employs magic. Yuman inquired about Salmon's comfort level. In response, the main character said that he put her to sleep in case anything similar happened. He assured them that since he would be calling upon spirit soldiers this time, they needed not worry. The Yuman let out a startled cry. A spirit with a red cloak and steel mask stood behind the main character. Nambung declared that they would begin by eliminating the goblin fighters. With a serious expression on his face, he stated that he needed to be ready for many surprises that lay ahead of him. A warrior goblin stands amidst the bonfires, encircled by goblins. He gasped and spun around. Nambung stood next to the dead goblin and threw the sword at him. The goblin warrior was stabbed in the eye by the sword, and he purred his lips while yelling something in his native tongue. The main character sprinted in his direction, growling. The goblin warrior scowled at the protagonist while covering one eye with his hand. He took a firm hold of the sword and swung it to hit the ground. Nambung shot forward, revealing two steel sticks between his fingers. He pierced the goblin's body with them. His blue vans bulging, he let out a painful scream and shivered. The main character scowled and exclaimed, Now! Yuman lunged towards the goblin, sabering it mercilessly. He slashed his sword against the goblin's neck. Yuman gasped in shock that the sword was staying outside of his body. Angrily, the goblin warrior showed off his teeth. He let out a loud cry in his native tongue. Nambung inquired as to why this was only the start of his muscle. The protagonist touched down beside him. Nambung asked where he got the poison darts and commented that they were good. Nambung retorted that he brought them to the underground plaza on Olji Street. Nambung proclaimed that it was a well-known location in Seoul and advised him to visit in order to purchase an automated nose hair remover. He was interrupted by the main character, who advised them to complete this before the goblin lord showed up. He promised they would complete it swiftly. The goblin warrior swung his sword and let out a shout. Nambung ducked out of the way as he swung in front of him. In his hand, three poison darts materialized. He propelled them ahead. The goblin warrior's chest was penetrated by the javelins. His mouth was hanging open as the blue vans on his body protruded. The skin around the darts turned blue as he knelt down. Yuman yelled, promising not to make the same mistake twice. The goblin warrior noticed a sword approaching him. 
Human swung his sword and severed the goblin warrior's head. He said that his hands were tired from his hard bones as he flexed his shoulders. He continued by saying that his biceps helped him deal with it. The main character gave the dead goblin a foot push and warned him not to loosen up because they were about to visit the goblin lord. He looked over at the broken statue. He saw that nobody was using the high ground. Where was the goblin lord? He inquired. Shaking his head, he turned. He yelled to Yuman, who turned to face him. A goblin lord wearing a red robe with a hood stood before him. There was a bundle of yellow energy in the goblin's hand. Yuman smiled and asked, what is it? Something flashed yellow behind him. Yuman was shielded from the magic strike by the spirit soldier who dashed to their rescue. Coughing, he put his hand over his face. Spirit soldier vanished out of sight. The protagonist scowled and surmised that it was because spirit soldiers were small statured. Squeezing his hand against his chest, he realized that he had not survived as long as he had anticipated. Two out of three summoned spirit soldiers, according to the dialogue box. Yuman swore and lunged forward, slapping his sword. He lunged forward to strike with his sword, but the goblin lord deflected the blow with a yellow magic barrier. The goblin lord suddenly opened his eyes. He extended his hands, and the shockwave knocked Yuman back. He let go of his sword and tumbled to the ground. He questioned me about it. Namgung claimed it was a shield as he picked up the sword from the ground. He clarified that although it wasn't an advanced spell, it was uncommon at this point. Yuman raised an eyebrow at him and inquired as to what action they ought to take. With a serious expression, the main character answered that they simply needed to break it more forcefully. He answered that at this point, they couldn't possibly surpass that. Namgung retorted that it was impossible for them to fail. He advised leaving it in the hands of the sword. Yuman said he didn't know what he meant, taking the sword from his grasp. It was described by the main character as a cursed object with a soul attached. Yuman surveyed the sword. Namgung reached over to touch his shoulder. He told him not to let go of the sword at all, his face serious. Triggering the eye of the soul, level 2, the dialogue box states. Yuman had a sword encased in crimson energy in his hand. The goblin lord gave him a startled look. He called out in his native tongue, and the goblins engaged in combat with the spirit soldier pivoted to face him. The goblin ruler extended his hand. The goblins rushed forward to attack Yuman and the protagonist as soon as he yelled something in his native tongue. Namgung cast a scowl. In his hand, a blade materialized. Silver blade, demon hunters, reads the dialogue box. Magic, rank 1. An expertly honed throwing blade. Its poor durability means that it will break after just one use. Creates a lethal effect when it shatter. 1000 head price. The protagonist flung the blade in front of him. It shot straight for the goblin's face. A brilliant red light was released as the blade cracked while in flight. The goblins were engulfed in flames as it exploded. Nambung frowned, realizing he could not buy him any more time and that Yuman had to take responsibility for his actions. Yuman growled, showing off her blackened teeth. Speaking through the executioner's soul that is bound to the sword, the dialogue box states. Yuman screamed violently, his eyes glowing scarlet. The dialogue box states that the spirit of the executioner has a bloodlust. There was black all over his arms and legs. The earth gave way beneath his feet. Human dashed in the direction of the goblin lord, trailing red-black energy in her wake. A crazed smile twisted his face. The goblin lord let go of yellow lightning bolts from his hands and cried out in terror in his own tongue. The goblin's hands were releasing a stream of yellow energy, but Human was drawing nearer and closer to him. Human was beaming maniacally, her body radiating red energy. A flash of yellow energy appeared before him. His sword broke through the barrier of yellow magic. In his own tongue, the goblin lord said something that shocked him. The barrier of magic gave way. Yuman smiled crazily, drawing even closer. The goblin lord was pierced through the chest by his sword. It stabbed into his sword as it stood over his body. The protagonist raised his head to the sky. The clouds started to break up as the enormous green eye in the sky started to close. With a single swing of his sword, the spirit soldier severed the goblin's head. Beside him, the goblin's head dropped to the ground. Above them, the sky cleared and became blue. Namgung scowled and gave a nod. The Goblin Lord has been vanquished, the dialogue box announces, giving a base reward to every participant in a 150-meter area. Nonetheless, participants who have a direct impact will receive a participation reward regardless of their distance. The player who deals the creature's last blow will receive a success reward. You will receive the Goblin Lord's loot. Only one of the reward claimants may take possession of the spoils. Several gleaming chests materialized on the terrain. Yuman inquired, what just happened, and what are these chests? With surprise, he retorted that it was time to gather up his spoils because he had vanquished him. The goblin lord's chest was preceded by chests that materialized on the ground. The chests before them parted. There are now dialogue boxes with the goblin lord's favorite and ornament. The dialogue box that appears says, goblin lord's bracelet. Rank, best, magic. A simple bracelet, yet it's filled with lord magic. Enables the use of shield magic at grade 5. 
maximum, five times daily. Human grinned and commented that it was good after placing the bracelet on his arm. He inquired as to whether the main character should give it to him. He said that he was already wearing it and that he would need it more. As the main character peered inside the chest, she saw something. You have acquired the rare Goblin Lord's heart, the dialogue box informs you. Heart by the magic of the Goblin Lord. When consumed, magic wielding abilities on the user. When mana is consumed, it increases for magic users. Prerequisites for magic are needed for stats. A green aura encircling a green heart was hovering above his hand. Yuman remarked, I'm surprised how good this item is. Namung added that those without natural talent weren't particularly adept at magic, so it wasn't really helpful for them. He thought as he tucked the heart into his coat that they would find someone to trade it for when the next gate of hell opened, and then they would have to sell it for a high price. The dialogue box started to flash red when he raised the heart to it. Would you like to look for talented subjects? The dialogue boxes ask. Rewards recipients can exchange goods and services. Upon noticing the words regarding the suggested subject, the main character considered whether or not such a function had previously existed. He believed that he was too preoccupied hunting demons to notice summons in his previous life. Considering that neither he nor Mimut are gifted with magic, he found the heart to be peculiar. According to the dialogue box, the target is suitable, assessing the magic factor's growth potential. A jet of blue energy shot from the main character's hand. He made his way toward the objective, and Namung followed him. The person on the ground was surrounded by blue energy. The main character surprised himself by opening his mouth. The dialogue box states, Nasaman is the recommended target. Legend grade, magic growth potential at its finest. Saman lay on the floor, surrounded by a blue aura. Namung reflected that he had never thought Saman would be drawn to magic. Given that he had lost Saman not long after the gates of hell opened, he reasoned that he couldn't have known. Observing the verdant heart, he reasoned that it was more than just a natural affinity for magic. Subsequently, it possessed both a legendary rank and a significant potential for advancement to the highest level. Even in his past life, he doubted that he had ever seen anyone like this. Namung praised it and inquired as to whether it indicated that Saman was destined to come into contact with blood. Nimhun informed him that he could not awaken Saman's magic if he so desired. He claimed that even as adults, they still struggle to defeat monsters. Niyuhun smiled and raised an eyebrow, saying that kids should have a better life than they do, even if the world ends in hell. Saman rubbed her eyes as she slowly opened them. She sat up and saw Nimhun and Namung. Niyuhun grinned and remarked that she had changed significantly since he had last seen her. He inquired as to whether she would like to go for a flight with him. Saman stood up and declared that she was an adult. Nimhun picked at his head. She asked, glancing around to see what was going on. She stopped, gazing away in disbelief. Human and goblin corpses lay strewn across the ground in front of her. Saman inquired as to whether Namung had promised that they would face this together no matter what. She turned to face the main character and inquired as to whether he had said that to her today. The main character apologized, lowering his gaze. A young boy approached Saman and pulled at her sleeve. She gave him a curious look. The boy made a help request. She inquired about the incident. The boy mentioned the monsters in his mother while pointing to the side. He gestured to the woman's body, from which a goblin sword protruded. The boy started sobbing aloud. Saman gave him a backward hug. She seemed surprisingly brave, according to Nimhun, maybe because of her Nambun-like appearance. In response, the main character said that she probably looks more like her mother than like him. He closed his eyes and said he was afraid and that's why he tried to surround his child with walls because he was weak. If it's not a natural thing to do, Niyuhan questioned. It's because he's her father, he said, his face fretting. Namgung gave him a shy smile as she looked at him. With a troubled expression, Saman turned to face the main character and proposed to take the boy with her. Namgung firmly declined. He claimed that there would be a shelter during the Great War and that he would be safer there than he would be with them. She claimed he was by himself. Saman bowed her head and remarked that it was unsettling to be alone when he said, No men no. She sadly said, squeezing her lips shut and saying, He wasn't there for her either when her mother went to heaven. Namgung's shocked eyes grew larger. As he emerged through the purple portal, Jordan grinned and said, I told you so. He inquired as to whether a man who accepts death while walking the path of life appeals to him. Namgung and Saman gave him a startled look. Jordan gave them props for taking down the Goblin Lord. He explained that the plan called for the Citadel to be completed before midnight, allowing goblins to proliferate throughout the city. Things have gotten really twisted, he claimed. The protagonist questioned what he was talking about and whether it wasn't true that he would benefit more from being more active. Jordan stated as much, holding up his index finger, but narrow-minded superiors didn't agree. He claimed that before the carnival even began, they were unhappy that he was leading the corpses in the role of soldiers. Namgung scowled and questioned why he wasn't making better use of the money he had. Tell them to back off, he said. He answered that they were correct and that everything ought to begin at the carnival with a broad smile. The protagonist inquired as to why. 
Jor indicated that it wasn't balanced by pointing his finger at it. He claimed to be able to use the abilities of legendary figures from antiquity as well as the souls of patriots. Nambung retorted that, considering his standing, he ought to consider his safety measures before attempting to discuss the regulations. He laughed and said he came to offer him a compromise because he knew he would. He said, raising his head and closing his eyes, that it was easy and that he should give his life for it. He clarified that he had to pay the price because he had already taken in some spirits. He opened his eyes and declared that although the rules demanded an equal exchange, they would settle this dispute with one life because they were also at fault. Jor gestured at the young one with a finger. He declared that he would leave it here in any case. The child was holding the same and, staring at him intensely, smirking. Jor declared that it was better to kill him now than to allow him to cause them trouble later. Nambung startledly opened his eyes, then enragedly demanded to know what this absurdity was. She gave Jordan a face punch. She questioned him about who he was telling people to kill. He gave her a scowl. From behind him, a stream of red energy shot up and swept Saman. He drove it hard against the wall, coughed up the blood that was pressed up against the wall. Nambung extended his hand and lunged at him. A crimson current of energy overtook him. The Inhun swung his sword and threw himself at Jordan, yelling for him to stop. The red energy stream also managed to catch up with him. After grabbing the three of them with his red tentacles, Jordan stood in front of the boy who had collapsed to the ground. Grinning broadly, he said that although he liked him, his daughter needed to be disciplined if she went too far. Nambung shot back, clenching his teeth and attempting to break free from the red snake's hold. Jordan questioned whether they ought to end it by taking their own lives, Saman's life, or the boy in Anhun's life. He told him to stop talking and decide. The main character swore vehemently. A verdant heart tumbled out of his jacket. It hit the stone floor below. A bright blue light glowed in his heart, and Jor grinned contentedly at him. Toward Saman, the blue light was traveling. Laughing, shrouded in the blue light, Jor said it was okay. Nambung clenched his teeth and realized that he had known about Saman's preference from the start and had done so deliberately to set up this predicament. He apologized to Saman, closing his eyes, saying that it was his fault and that at the very least he wanted to save her. Then he said that he wasn't at fault. She gave him a smile and assured him that he could never have made a bad decision, not even in the future. She expressed her trust in him. Nam Saman is being soothed by a fragile soul, the dialogue box states. Behind Saman, who was surrounded by blue light, a white-dressed woman materialized. The red energy that was surrounding her faded. The dialogue box states that Saman's awakening is being aided by the soul. The magical quality is changing. Tears filled Saman's eyes. Her eyes were blue in one and red in the other when she opened them. According to the dialogue box, her magic has changed into perception magic. Nambin gave her a startled look. Then, surrounded by blue light, stood upright. She raised her palms. With her hands folded in front of her, she formed a purple ball and scowled, declaring that this scoundrel was the cause of it. She released a powerful purple energy beam at Jordan, who was gazing at him with composure. He gave me a big smile. He extended his hand to greet the violet energy beam. Grinning, he held out his palm, which took in the purple energy. Jor thought it was adorable. He said, clenching his fist in front of his face, that she employed magic of a legendary caliber. He remarked to Nambung that it appeared he had discovered a person more fascinating than himself. The main character and Mimhun fell to the ground as the red snake scattered. Then, engulfed in blue energy, she stood, her hands extended, commanding Jor to remain motionless. Her breathing was labored. She collapsed to the floor as her eyes rolled upward. Jordan walked up to her and explained that perception magic was a powerful magic that would require a lot of mana for her, an ordinary child who had just awoken to her magical abilities. With one hand extended, he knelt beside her, and a blue glow surrounded him. Namgun yelled loudly. He warned him not to dare touch his daughter while clinging to his hand. He declared that he would kill him regardless of whether he was a higher being or something else. With a cool smile, Jor answered that he was merely attempting to assist her and wasn't going to do anything to her. Saman was lying on the ground, breathing heavily, her body engulfed in blue energy. She did not wake, instead her breathing evened out and she smiled contentedly. The main character was advised by Jordan to give thanks to his daughter. He claimed that because the other celestial beings appeared to enjoy it, they would permit them to get away with it. Namgung took Saman into his arms in silence. Jordan reminded him that in addition to monsters, he now has to keep his daughter safe from higher spirits who are pursuing her. The protagonist scowled back and said that he, as his all-powerful being, ought not to stand by and do nothing. Beside him, a red sphere dropped to the earth. Smiling, Jor stated that this item ought to be made after the goblin castle was finished. Goblin Citadel Crystal Ball, a crystal ball that forms a cave-level shelter, is described in the dialogue box. You could raise the level of the shelter to make it larger. Jor claimed that he took it from the higher beings because they wanted to give it to him as a reward at the next carnival. 
he asked, smiling, if he was living up to his contract as the god he had been working so hard to please. The protagonist said nothing. Standing in front of the purple portal, Jordan declared that he would keep an eye on them going forward and that their survival is necessary to protect his winnings. Nambung silently watched him leave. Slowly, Saman opened her eyes. Standing up in the car's backseat, she inquired about the situation. She claimed to have simply fought with Jordan. Ninun claimed that mana overload caused her to pass out. What was wrong with that child? She inquired. Ninun questioned whether she was referring to Samsung. He claimed that he had already been sent to the Jin shelter, then pulled the main character's hair and claimed to have advised him to accompany them. Namgung retorted that it was far safer to go there rather than accompany them. He believed that the shelter in Jin is the safest location in South Korea because of Jin Sohak, an army member. He informed her that a man by the name of Jin Sohak was present and that they had previously known one another. Then, with resentment, she crossed her arms and spread her legs widely. They shouldn't be concerned because, as the main character stated, he is someone he trusts. He asked them where they were going now and said the shelter in Jin was safe, according to her. They were headed to Seoul, he said. He claimed that a new gate to hell opened in Seoul following the closure of the first one. A dome of blue energy envelops the island in the center of the river. Namgung placed his face on his hand and stated that they must receive a reward for this dungeon in order to stop an even greater calamity, then withdrew his gaze. Ninhun inquired about the main character's status as a prophet, someone selected by higher powers. Namgung answered truthfully. Ninhun inquired about the next course of action. In response, the main character said it was nothing special, just a way to get stronger. They pass a bridge lined with overturned vehicles. The radio announced urgent traffic news. The voice said that the Paju Expressway was closed because of the destruction of Sias and Junction, and train service had been suspended because of damage to the rails. Ninhun scowled and remarked that it appeared that using the highway would be challenging. He was also on board and assured me that he would be alright because he was a strong man. He declared that he thought they ought to take the national route. He scowled and turned to look surprised. The windshield was broken when the goblin fell on it. They stopped their skating. If Saman was all right, Ninhun inquired as to what it was, then said she was all right. Namung believed that some people still needed to be taken care of. He exited the vehicle. Something struck his cheek as it flew past his face. The goblin behind him was struck in the head by the arrow. A bespectacled man in a tracksuit standing in front of him brandished a bow. He said that the monsters had suddenly started to run at him and apologized. He lowered his bow, and Namgung motioned for him to speak. The man bowed his head and said he was sorry. Namgung inquired as he examined the dead goblins whether he had killed them all. The man answered that it was accurate. Ninhun grinned and remarked that he had good vision because he was only aiming at their important locations at midnight. The main character believed that a regular civilian could kill five monsters with a single bow. Given his talent, he reasoned that he might have known him in a past existence. Namgung inquired as to his name. In response, the man said that his name was John Jong-in. Ninhun questioned how he got into this situation given that everyone had been advised to stay at home by the radio. Jong-in stated that he had to travel to Seoul. He claimed that he was unable to contact his father because he was in the hospital. Namgung realized that even a gifted mage like Salmon couldn't survive, which was why he hadn't met him in the past. He advised him to return home since he wouldn't be able to ride his bike halfway and would perish. John Jong-in bowed his head and requested assistance and a ride to Seoul. He assured them that he would pay them back in full. Namgung inquired about the money. John jong and promised to pay back the purple stone that was in his hands. He claimed he had no idea what it was, but it materialized as the monsters were about to perish. Dinan stated that neither he nor the main character kept the stones as pets after picking up the stone. Namgung sprinted over to take hold of his arm. Did it appear when the goblins were dying? He inquired. Ninun hesitantly declared that the ideal pastime is raising rocks as pets. The main character expressed surprise at the purple stone's appearance and stated that it shouldn't have shown up now. They are driving on a congested road. If he wasn't lying after all, the main character questioned. John jong in retorted that the goblin stone had actually fallen out. Namgun casts a scowl at the violet stone. It was an agility rune, he said. A person can obtain two different kinds of power, nature and characteristics, during the carnival. The dialog box states that agility is the lowest grade of Rhine. It increases the agility stat by a small amount when used. Nature is endowed with unique abilities from birth. Conversely, stats are the power that anyone can gain by leveling them up. Runes are special objects that amplify these qualities. Though the odds of obtaining them from a monster are incredibly slim, everyone wants them. According to Namgung, there existed a theoretical possibility that they could have tumbled off the goblin. John jong and inquired as to the rarity of the stone. The protagonist frowned, realizing that luck had nothing to do with this. He turned and asked the boy where he had learned to shoot an arrow. John jong and retorted that he was taught by his father, a former national representative. He continued by saying that an accident has left him bedridden. 
Ninon remembered the National Archery Team member with the last name of John, pondering. John Teo, according to John Jong In, is his name. The main character assumed it was John Teo, the athlete's son, as he had anticipated. John Teo was a rune master in a previous life, and he had an extremely unique personality that he shared only with Anna Leong. Clans from all over the world fought for his recruitment, but John Teo had been unconscious for seven years after an accident. Saint Esra, one of the eight martial stars, spent a lot of money using an elixir as everyone screamed to awaken him. But behind the scenes, she committed sinister acts befitting her title. John Teo was killed by her for turning down the clan's offer. Nambang pondered, serious on his face, that this would be different. If he should visit the hospital, Ninhan inquired. The protagonist stated that they must first make a stop. They vowed to take him to his father, John Jong-in exclaimed. Saman gave him support. He inquired as to what would happen if he had an incident during their wait. In response, the main character said that leaving now would not affect anything. According to him, the goblin situation prompted the activation of the army, police, and firefighters throughout Korea. According to him, during these times, stabilizing medical facilities was given top priority, making the hospital a safer place than this road. Nambang advised them to save up their heads since going there would have no bearing on the outcome. Giant Jong and inquired as to their meaning. In response, the main character said that they had an elixir that would cure his father. Frowning, Jian Zhang and inquired about the elixir. Nambing retorted that the elixir is only available for 400,000 heads, and there's nowhere else you can get this much money so fast. Ninhan grinned and remarked that he felt fortunate that they were visiting the dungeon. Jian Zhang and was informed by Saman that her father was living a double life and that he was well informed. She assured him that great rewards awaited him if he joined them. With a raised eyebrow, he inquired, where would they be able to buy the elixir even if they saved up heads? In response, the main character said he would soon enough find out. The car's display indicates that it is midnight. Cars were scattered when multiple brilliant yellow rays from the sky struck the road. Then, in shock, inquired as to what it was. Just in time, Nambang said. A foot landed on an automobile's wheel. It was the Yaxia. People gaze out their car windows, curious about what's going on and what it is. Yaxia smiled, gestured with his index finger, and instructed them to pay close attention. He said, grinning wickedly, that from this point forward, the phases gave the audience of the carnival an opportunity to awaken. Fearful, the woman fled. The guys yelled at Yaxia to move aside. Yaxia yelled at them to stop talking. He unleashed the roar of Yaxia, a stream of yellow energy that blew past the cars and people in front of him. In front of him was a burning trail in the earth. He asked if they knew to listen when someone was speaking while wiping his mouth. He claimed that all the information they needed would be transferred to their minds automatically, negating the need for a thorough explanation. Nonetheless, he would formally make an announcement. Yaxia was about to say that the holiday's rules are straightforward when a car horn honked. He gave that side an enraged glare. Yaxia inquired as to what sort of was honking his car horn. Nambin announced it was him as he got out of the vehicle. He scowled and made fun of Yaxia. Yaxia clenched his teeth tensely as he recognized him. The protagonist claimed that his sentences are a little too brief. Niyuhan inquired as to whether he was referring to the Yaxia. He claimed that he appeared more powerful than a goblin. Yaxia approached them and questioned whether he was brave enough to call him a goblin. Yaxia placed his hand on the shoulder of the main character. He asked him, fearfully and in a quiet way, how he knew he was here. Given the large number of witnesses present, he asked to have a portion of it spared. Namgun promised to say more than one. He instructed him to reveal everything, including his heart pouch and bundle. Yaxia asked for his heart pouch and expressed surprise that they hadn't even signed a contract. The protagonist asked if he would rather give him the elixir after glaring at him menacingly. Yaxia frightenedly responded, I'm worth 400,000 heads. Not that he had nearly that much. Namgun reported that his wounds had healed. With reluctance, Yaxia took hold of his hand and explained that he couldn't since he would get into trouble for breaking the rules, especially since the carnival had already begun. Jian Zhang, asking him what he was discussing with a monster like this that was merely preparing a man in this place. In response, Nam Hun said he wasn't sure, but since it was still Nam Min's second life, it was best to keep the strange happening without giving it too much thought. Yaxia and the protagonist ascend the cars while conversing about something. Jian Zhang and once more rejected the notion of a second life. Nambin waved as he walked out, and Yaxia bowed. Niyuhan observed that they appeared to be finished. Salmon inquired as to what they had been discussing for so long. The Yaxia behind them began reiterating to the crowd the rules of the carnival. Nambin retorted that he bought survival supplies with his pocket money. He averted his gaze. A blue dome covered the island next to the burning city. Nambin mentioned that they would require them to endure there. Jian Zhang claimed that all of the explanations for the carnival had appeared in his head while he was holding his head in his hand. He inquired as to what was happening. 
Nambin retorted that Yaxia was instilling fundamental knowledge about the carnival in people's minds, and he started doing so as soon as it was publicized. Yaxia laughed while perched atop the cars and urged the occupants to make an effort to live. Jian Zhang opened his mouth in shock, questioning whether this was actually possible and whether the information about his second life was accurate. Nim Hun inquired as to what should be done with the car from the main character. He instructed him to pick her up as he removed his coat. Nim Hun asked, his mouth hanging open in shock, if it was truly possible to enter the dungeon by car. He had visions of himself driving a car and smashing goblins. Namven informed him that he would be heading to Sinchan while he was searching through the car's trunk. He clarified that they would meet there when they were finished and that that was the dungeon's exit. Niu Hun questioned why he, an adult, couldn't stop the children from fighting in the dungeon. In response, he said that a larger battle would take place in Sinchan at dusk. Namvin pointed to something and said he now knew about it too because of the information they had discovered. He claimed that a set number of monsters emerged from the gates of hell, and that even if the gates were closed earlier, there is an occasion known as dusk when the last of the monsters still emerge all at once. Then, even if they swiftly shut the gates of hell, the damage would ultimately remain the same, as Niuhan exclaimed in shock. That's why he was going there, he said as he shut the trunk. Namvin turned to face him and said he would have to defend the people. Niuhan gave him a startled look. Rely on him, he said, grinning and giving himself a chest smack. The protagonist grimaced, realizing that while there would undoubtedly be many casualties, there would also be many opportunities to score goals. He believed that by buying the elixir, they would be able to win over Runemaster Giantio's trust. As he put on his black coat, he promised that they would join him as soon as they were out of the dungeon. He invited Giant Zhong and Salmon inside. The zombie's head was struck by the arrow. With the bow in hand, Jian Zhang let out a breath. With a frown on her face and her hands extended, Salmon released a burst of red and blue energy. After taking a look at it, Jian Zhang exclaimed, It's really magical, with surprise. He questioned whether the reality he was familiar with had vanished. The protagonist was informed by Salmon that he ought to have warned her in advance that there would be zombies in the dungeon. She claimed that it resembled the live-action Underworld series she had watched online a lot. When she encountered such zombies, Jian Zhang and questioned her in shock about how she managed to remain composed. Salmon retorted that since they had played in the underworld, modern kids were not afraid of zombies. She went on to say that she occasionally enjoys streaming. Jian Zhang inquired as to whether she was referring to a well-known game. He acknowledged his lack of skill at games. She responded that she had a knack for them while shutting her eyes. According to Salmon, there is only one player that comes to mind who is better than her, Flame. This dungeon is very basic, she continued. Naming warned her against exerting herself too much because she might overdo it again. She concurred. The main character peered over the wall at the horde of zombies. He beckoned Jian Zhang inside. He replied, and the arrows struck the zombies in the head with great speed. With an eyebrow raised, the main character declared that he had struck each of them in the head. Is he going to try to follow in his father's footsteps and become a professional athlete? Jian Zhang and retorted that he had begun firing arrows at the goblin's appearance. He claimed that he sensed the target growing in size. Naming surmised that he had become more proficient with his bow. He believed that he had anticipated that his gift would be connected to runes like Giant Teo. What else had changed, he inquired. He put his hand on his chest and stated that he would speak up once he was certain that something was changing. With a startled gesture, Salmon moved to stand between them. Zombies surrounded a chest that was covered in a purple aura at the opposite end of the room. With streams of blue and red energy shooting from her hands, she ran towards him, destroying the zombies in her path. Naming yelled at her to stop while extending his hand. Salmon continued to run while releasing magic with her hands. The main character clenched his teeth and believed that the explosion was drowning out his voice. If his memory served him well, this dungeon contained a trap, he reasoned. He yelled for Jian Zhang to shoot him in the chest. Jian Zhang and grimaced as he pulled the bowstring. An arrow flew by Salmon's side as she joyfully reached for the chest. Something exploded. The protagonist called out to Salmon while using his hands to shield himself from the explosion. A man's silhouette is visible amid a dispersing dust cloud. She inquired about the cause of the explosion, given the disheveled state of Salmon's hair. Namgung, relieved that she was alright, rushed over to her. Telling her it was a dungeon trap, he went down to her and grabbed her by the shoulders. She clarified that although she was spared a direct hit because of Jian Zhongin, she would instantly perish if she opened the chest. Jian Zhongin inquired about death by instant. He thought he ought to have warned about this in advance as he opened his mouth in surprise. It was sad, Salmon said, irritated. The protagonist disagreed and declared that this was a good thing. A golden key was lying on the floor. Namgun claimed to be holding the boss room key as he held it up in his hand. They stood before an enormous door. The main character indicated that the ghoul king was waiting for them behind the door by touching it with his hand. Jian Zhongin and Salmon both took nervous breaths. Nuhun reports that there is a lot of traffic while she is traveling down the road. 
He claimed that he couldn't just toss the car anywhere because it belonged to the main character. A declaration was made. This advertisement is from the National Emergency Management Agency's Central Control Office. Everyone living in Seoul is asked to leave right away and head for the closest shelters. People began to run around Nuhan in a panic, and they surprised him by asking what was going on. He scowled in shock as he peered out of the car, unsure if it had started yet. The sky had a massive yellow hole in it. People were panicking and fleeing. It's getting dusk now, the dialogue box says. For Namgung and the others, the door opened. A number of large zombies stood behind it. You have entered the tomb of the ghoul king, the dialogue box says. The main character announced that there were four elite zombies in the room in addition to the ghoul king before opening the door. He declared that the ghoul king would not vanish unless they were killed. Salmon surmised that elite zombies would withstand multiple hits before succumbing. Zhang in proposed that by cooperating, they could address each individual as one at a time. Namgung objected, claiming that the ghoul king would bring them back time and time again. That is to say, he said, they wouldn't even be able to scratch the ghoul king if they didn't destroy all four of them at once. If he had purchased anything from Yeksh, Salmon inquired. He claimed to use it in the dungeon, according to her. This is true, according to the main character. Paladin Rail's pendant, the dialogue box says, grade, most elusive, best. The artifact belonging to Rail, the greatest paladin in history, bestows the bearer with the ability to be purified. Namgum, who was holding the necklace, claimed that they would be able to impede the zombies' resurrected progress. He said it would be challenging to prevent the simultaneous resurrection of all four of them. The protagonist scowled. The first line of defense was over, a voice in the city yelled. Soldiers used submachine guns and machine guns to fire shots. There was a shout that the second line was in danger as well. They need air support, a scarred man yells over the radio. They asked if there was any chance that there were survivors on the other end of the line. The man scowled and stated that no civilians were in the summoning point after they had previously checked using the heat detector. He questioned whether it was true that goblins were being called here from all over the world. He yelled that they would go out of control if they didn't kill them right away. The damage would be greater than what occurred when the gates of hell opened, the man yelled. He was informed that the media would find something to whine about and create a stir, accusing the army of destroying the city even if there were no survivors. They recommended considering public opinion. If they were willing to sacrifice them in order to maintain their reputation, the man yelled. He hung up the radio receiver, swearing. There is a civilian car approaching, a soldier yelled. Surprisingly, the man inquired if they were aware of what was happening. He commanded them to leave immediately. The soldier opened his mouth to speak. Goblins are struck by the car as it travels down the city road. Namhoon clenches his teeth and grips the steering wheel angrily. His face's veins were enlarged. The soldier said he believed him to be insane. On a throne behind the four elite zombies is the ghoul king. Namgung announced their approach while encircled by spirit warriors. Then, with energy tinged with blue and cyan, she swung her hand. She extended her hands, and the elite zombie's arms were severed by the energy streams. The elite zombie struck the ground with its hand, but Zhang Zhang sidestepped it by jumping to the side. If his body was ripped apart, he questioned how he managed it. He should have just gone to the hospital, he thought, and pulled the bowstring. The top zombie's head was pierced by the arrow. The soldiers of the protagonists charged forward. The elite zombie fell to the ground as they swung their swords and severed its legs. Namgung displayed a necklace that illuminated the zombie with a purple light. He urged them to hurry and finish the other three zombies as he passed the one that had fallen to the ground. Then, Zhang Zhang engaged in zombie combat. The main character is standing in front of him, glowing purple necklace in the light. Perched on a throne is the ghoul king. With a gesture of his finger, he spoke in his native tongue. Zhang Zhang and claimed that he had been idle the entire time. What did he say suddenly, he asked, then inquired about reviving with astonishment. Namgung glanced at her and realized he understood what the ghoul king had said. He surmised that Sua's influence was the reason. He reasoned that her newly discovered non-elemental magic power might be explained if her mother's soul had interfered with her awakening. The main character had never seen anything like it in his past life, so he assumed it was just a theory. He instructed Saman to continue relaying to them the words of the ghoul king. She concurred. The zombie's body started to heal its wounds. The zombie raised its head, starting to resemble itself again. The undead stood to their feet. When one of them struck the ground, Namgung leaped aside to avoid it. He realized as he touched down that there could never be just one necklace. Observing the necklace he was holding, he considered that although he had never attempted it in a past life, there didn't appear to be another option. Namgung yelled for Saman to use her magic on him while holding the necklace above his head. He believed that by using this necklace to disperse Saman's magic, he would be able to instantly wipe out everyone. The undead made a fist. The protagonist leaped out of the way of the hit. He is encircled by zombies. She cried out, her hands extended, and her eyes full of tears, expressing her fear that she might not survive. She witnessed Jianjong pulling his bow's string. 
With one shot, he took out the heads of two zombies. Namgung urged him to shoot right away while praising him for his hard work and holding up the necklace. The necklace glowed purple in his hand. The glass in the necklace broke when the zombie knocked it out of the main character's hands. It dropped to the ground. The two zombies seized the hands of the protagonist's soldiers and vanished. Leaning forward, the ghoul king smiled and spoke in his own tongue, then questioned if this was the end in shock. Nangang was seated on the ground and encircled by zombies. His hand was bleeding as he held onto the broken necklace. This was just the beginning, he said, grinning sinister. The undead lunged towards him. Namgung grasped the shattered glass in his hands. He threw the shards at the two zombies, swinging his arms. They lost their balance as they stabbed into their chests. The protagonist was attacked by a zombie that swung his hand in front of him. Namgung put his hand over his head. He scowled and gave the order to Saman then extended her hands and released a stream of blue and red energy. The main character's surroundings were infected by her magic. With a shout in his native tongue, the ghoul king sat up. Namgung approached him and informed him that it was now his turn. With one arm extended, the zombie lunged towards him. Behind the main character, a black spirit materialized, and Namgung commanded the zombie to retreat. With a single swing of the sword, the spirit severed the zombie's head and arm. The ghoul king bellowed in his native tongue. A dark blade went through his skull. A spirit stood beside the main character, its sword driven deep into the skull of the ghoul king. The chest of the ghoul king shifted. His jagged ribs started to move as the skin on it tore. The main character coughed up blood after they stabbed him in the body. A spike went through his chest, then yelled a word to him. A man clad in military gear identified Meng Hoon as he sat in the car. Surprised, he inquired as to why he was there. They hadn't seen one another in a while, he remarked, grinning. Munhoon said with a smile and an eyebrow raised that he is a hero who shows up when the world needs him. He predicted that the boss would arrive sooner or later as he got out of the car. Surprised, the man asked if he meant Namgung. Munghoon attested. He said that they should maintain this posture up until then, crossing his arms over his chest. The man said he understood, giving his head a scratch. He claimed that no free weapons were available for them. Munghoon retorted that it wasn't necessary. He pulled out his sword, beaming, and declared that he had something amazing. The man saw the sword materialize out of thin air and opened his mouth in surprise. He inquired as to whether he would use a sword to combat the monsters, who were essentially bulletproof. Meng Hoon claimed that since they were so full of knowledge, he ought to already be aware of the gates of hell in Yaksha. The man's brows went up. According to Meng Hoon, firearms are no longer regarded as weapons. With a sly smile, he gave him the practical weapons and informed him that they were now real. Ogre Tonfa, the dialogue box says, Rank, average, and top composed of ogre bones. Not very remarkable, but very sturdy. Rumored to be able to strike magical creatures once and crush their heads. The man became aware of the taunts. In their platoon, Meng Hoon claimed he managed them skillfully. He said that since he paid all of his earnings for them and that they were very different, he should treat them like his fiancé. Meng Hoon gave him a quick glance and a satisfied smile. The man pursed his lips as he looked at him. He let the machine gun fall to the floor. They stood side by side in a combat stance. With her hand extended and a yell directed at her father, Samantha ran towards him. Jian Jiang asked her to wait while placing his hand on her shoulder. He put his glasses back on his nose and said he thought he could handle this alone. His yellow eyes gleamed. He mentioned finding the zombie ruler, whose hands the main soldier had banished and who was facing them. Zeropris and Jian Jiang flung the ghoul king's chest. Nambung wondered if his weak point was in his chest rather than his head as he turned to face them. Jian Jiang and Kamli instructed Simon to render the ghoul king immobile. Without understanding his abrupt behavior shift, Salmon nodded. Her hands released a stream of magic. On the shoulder of the ghoul king, Jian Jiang and Zeropris. Nambung was taken aback by Edoi's sudden appearance and questioned his intentions, as well as the reason behind his aim for Plaki rather than the head. He believed that the shot should have been accurate given his skill. Jian Jiang and instructed him to repeat the action without inflicting harm to the head. From her hands, Salmon unleashed magic. The ghoul king waved his hands to block her magic. Upon deflecting her magic, Salmon let out a startled exclamation. The ghoul monarch sprang toward her. Jian Jiang, letting go of his bowstring. The ghoul king's chest was punctured by the arrow. Smoking, he collapsed to the ground. The ghastly monarch gave way. Nambung claimed he didn't really need to use the necklace because he killed the man with ordinary arrows while holding his wound in his hand. How did he do it? He asked. Jian Jiang, scratching his head and speculatively remarking that certain parts of their bodies were shiny. He claimed that they will drop runes if you kill them and aim at them in the proper order. Picking up a blue stone from the ground, the main character inquired about the odds. Upon further reflection, Jian Jiang retorted that not every one of them is bright. He described it as an opening, and if an enemy shines, there is a 100% chance that runes will fall from it. The protagonist reasoned that killing the ghoul king without a necklace might involve more than just dropping runes as he studied the stone in his hand. 
Nambung believed it was either luck or the creatures with shining runes. He reasoned that by combining his abilities with Giant Yaw, he could possibly obtain some runes if it came down to luck. He believed he had a good one. When Saemon discovered the chest covered in a blue aura, she exclaimed. She inquired as to why it should be real this time. It opened, a chest. It says batch reward chest granted in the dialogue boxes. Nambung grinned menacingly as she peered inside the chest. He believed it to be the lottery. Ghoul King's silver normal has been acquired, according to the dialogue box. Through the proxy clan, 15 O-heads can be traded for heads. Trade permitted between reward recipients. Ghoul King's gold normal is now yours. 15 0 heads then celebrates his financial gain while cradling his face in his hands. You have obtained the Ghoul King's Aura Gloves magic, the dialogue box informs you. Trade permitted between reward recipients. Giant Young asked what it was as she held a glove that was enveloped in a green aura. The dialogue box claims that grade magic with the Ghoul King's Aura Gloves improves concentration the most. It's rotten. He uses two fingers to hold up the gloves while describing how they stink and only serve one purpose. Nambung stated that focus is required for more than just precise attacks while clutching a bag of gold coins. He claimed it could be used for anything, including using magic and creating magical objects. He also said that the odor would subside. Giant Jiang and covered his hand with a glove because it's that nice. He squeezed his nose to get rid of the odor. The main character stated that it would take three years for the smell to totally go away after he puked rainbow vomit. This is where the main reward is, he said. Giant Yong and suddenly turned to look at him angrily. Ghoul King's old keys grade magic best, the dialogue box states. A key belonging to Krato, the emperor who subjugated the entire continent of Erinsar. Nambung, who was holding a bunch of keys, claimed that one of the keys could unlock the Ghoul King's treasure, and it appeared that there was a key on the bunch for every one of them. Samur inquired about the document he was holding. He claimed that a new dungeon will open if they use this scroll in the treasury. According to the main character, they would split up if they went underground. He warned them not to freak out if they ended up alone. He gave the keys to them. Salmon thoughtfully explained that she had to select one of the doors and that the most crucial aspect was that once you were inside, you were unable to exit. Jian Jiang had inquired of Nambung as to the best option. In response, the main character said he didn't know because he hadn't cleaned this place out in a past life. The man who cleaned the place got the crown of Kundal, that's all he knew, he said. He clarified that since it was a necromancer's item, it would be of no use to them. Jian Jiang and considered claiming that this is his second life, but he is ignorant of a great deal of information. Nambun continued, saying they didn't need to be overly cautious when selecting the door because this was the first dungeon. He hurried them on, saying that Muhan was probably already waiting for them. Nambung averted his gaze. He looked up as he opened his eyes. He awoke in a massive, tall tower. The main character claimed that despite Jordan's escape being more spectacular, this location is much larger. He clarified that it was true that they were discussing the emperor. He moved ahead. Nambung turned to face the door after noticing something. On the door it says Mornu's Thorn Blade. The main character stated that each door had only a name and no explanation, just as he had anticipated. He considered how the Thorn Blade of Mornu was something he had seen in a past life. These are the identical twin daggers that Shinomiya, the Japanese demon hunter, uses. Nambung didn't believe it was crucial enough to take it this time. The protagonist carried on climbing the tower. His hand found the door. He said, beaming, that it originated here. Nambung claimed he could not find out how to obtain them and that he had only heard rumors. As stated in Balansar's book on the door, it turns out that getting it so early was possible, he said. The protagonist grasped the doorknob. He was in a room filled with purple light. A purple book stood on a pedestal in the middle of the room. The message box refers to the Book of Balansar, Grade, Best, Magic, a book written when the strange mage Balansar was younger. Exchange a random item for another. The grades of items can vary from common to uncommon. The grade of the original item has no bearing on the new item. The book is finished when it is used. Sitting on the floor are Giant, Young, and Insamen. At the sound, they turned. Nambun left the portal behind. He walked up to them and inquired about their decision. Giant, Young, and claimed to have given everything careful thought. However, the details were peculiar and he wasn't sure if he had made the right choice. Nambung was asked to examine her bracelet by Insamen, who then extended her hand. Upon examining her bracelet, the main character revealed that her magic power is marginally increased while she sleeps with the healing effects enabled. He thought it was a wise decision. Young, Jian, and claimed he selected it. He produced a sword from behind him. Nambung questioned why he chose the sword over the bow. Is there a bow in there? He inquired. Jian, Jung, adding that he was just fond of the moniker. If he knew how to use a sword in combat, the main character questioned. Jian, Jung, and smiled again, expressing his liking for the name. Nambung silently observed him, his expression twisted with delight. 
A man wearing a soldier's uniform uses tonfa blows to chop off the heads of goblins. Nambung sliced the goblin in half with a single sword swing. They face away from one another as goblins surround them. These tonfas were great, said the man with the nervous smile. Nabung concurred. The man claimed that the goblins had no end in sight because there were only two of them. Nambung questioned whether he was already tired while grinning. He inquired as to the whereabouts of their squad's endurance king. The man saw this and asked, with a nervous smile, if he had the strength to joke. Nambung made a U-turn. A mass of enraged goblins is fleeing the underground descent. The soldiers are yelling that they must retreat because their troops have reached their breaking point. Nambung yelled, what will happen to cinch on them? He yelled at them to quit boasting and take out at least one more person. The man objected, saying their troops were worn out. The sword of the goblin is in the air. Nambung took a step back. The man saw the approaching sword and his mouth dropped open. With a swift motion, Nambung covered him with his body and stabbed him in the back with the sword. The individual yelled at him. Nambung squatted, shivering. He finds it difficult to discuss the immobilizing poison. The man knelt beside him and yelled that they had to get away quickly so they could tend to his injuries. Nambung protested, claiming he was all right. The man objected, saying he needed medical help immediately and that they didn't know what was in it, so it was goblin poison. Scrambling upright, Nambung declared that should they retreat, Sinchan would tumble and the goblins would disperse throughout Seoul. He took hold of the man's wrist and ordered him to carry on fighting as a Kang Hajin in addition to a soldier. He clenched his teeth and had visible bruises beneath his eyes. Kang Hajin flung open his eyes. He had his tonfa clenched. The goblins pivoted to gaze upon him. Kang Hajin approached them with two tonfas in hand while panting heavily. On the news, a young man is interviewed. What had he seen? They asked. In response, the man said he was too wild to be considered human. The goblins were tearing apart in his hands like scraps of paper, so he figured he wasn't human. If he had battled them by himself, the interviewer questioned. In response, the boy said that a man carrying a massive sword was present. If he believed they might be prophets, he was asked. The interviewer retorted that the prophets are the world's saviors, citing a statement made by British actor Alec Tramon during yesterday's press conference. The man hesitantly said, I'm not sure. He claimed they resembled destroyers rather than heroes. Amid goblin corpses, Kang Hajin stands. A soldier is stabbed with a sword by a goblin wearing a flower on its head. A man dressed like a soldier stands between goblin corpses. Startled, the goblin holding the flower pivoted around. With a menacing expression, Kang Hajin stood before him. The colored goblin asked, horrified, what it was. A massive goblin moved to stand between them and, using his own language, told the goblin holding the flower to give it to him. The flower-carrying goblin desired to protest. He was interrupted by a large goblin who yelled at him to leave right away. Shocked, the Inhun inquired as to whether it was a warrior. He also mentioned how much smaller he was than the goblin warrior they had faced previously. Even if this warrior were smaller, he said with a frown, it would be too risky for Kang Hajin to face him by himself. His eyes slid to the car. In front of a massive goblin is Kang Hajin. He said, his eyes hollow, the goblin was big. The goblin threw his fist, but Kang Hajin deflected it by extending his tanfa. He said, gritting his teeth, my punch is weak. He claimed that his blow was unique and genuine when he delivered the tanfa. The goblin bowed as he struck its torso. The goblin, amazed at the man's strength, cried out in its own tongue. Kang Hajin, also known as Ogre, had control over his breathing. He can reduce the amount of blood going to his brain by using this ability. It acts in this way to protect the blood that the brain has absorbed. 20% of the oxygen that the respiratory system takes in is used by the adult brain. Put another way, it consumes 600 milliliters of oxygen on average every minute. It also needs a significant quantity of glucose. He gains superhuman strength and increased tissue regeneration, but he also loses some brain function by using this high-quality blood in his muscles instead of his brain. This is the ogre state of Kang Hajin. With one hand on its chest, the massive goblin knelt down. He considered the man to be a monster in his own tongue. Holding a tanfa in front of him was Kang Hajin. The flower-wielding goblin charged at him, slamming his sword into him. A massive goblin yelled at Lily, telling her to come on over. Lily had her back to him. She turned around, grinned, and explained that it was because he was a dear friend. The massive goblin was shifted. A goblin dropped a bloody flower from its head. He landed in front of the massive goblin that was sprawled out on the ground. His red-hot rage lit up his eyes. He smacked Kang Hajin savagely across the face with his fist. He was flung backward by the impact and landed on the asphalt. With one leg extended, the goblin jumped towards him. As soon as he touched it, Kang Hajin coughed up blood, killing the ogre. It is impossible to hold the ogre condition for extended periods of time because its underlying cause restricts blood flow to the brain. If the blood supply to the brain is cut off, a normal person will die in a matter of tens of seconds. It can last a little longer than five minutes because the ogre's condition does not totally stop the blood flow to the brain, but it was not given much time. 
One minute remains in the time. The vehicle is approaching on the road. A massive goblin scans the rapidly approaching car. The goblin was forced into the wall by the car. Nuhan hurried out of the vehicle to inquire about Kang Hajin's well-being. He was on the floor, lying down. Nuhan, gritting his teeth, saw the explosion coming from behind him. Something enormous came out of the flames. His eyes were filled with tears. Noticing the goblin's tears, Kang Hajin inquired as to whether the reason for his tears was the death of the goblin holding the flower. He told him to stop blaming other people while gritting his teeth. He said that they were to blame for the deaths of soldiers and civilians as he stood up. He inquired as to his anger. Kang Hajin expressed his anger. His mouth was bleeding, his eyes were empty, and his face was swollen in the veins. There are seven seconds left. The massive goblin lunged forward, yelling in its native tongue. Five seconds remain. Kang Hajin yelled as he charged. Four seconds remain. The goblin threw his handball. Three seconds remaining. Kang Hajin made a tantha swing. Two moments remain. Nuhan let out a shout. One more second. The goblin and Kang Hajin are swinging at one another while facing one another. A massive goblin with a huge hole in its torso is lying on the ground. On the ground lies Kang Hajin. He has Nuhan seated next to him. He claimed to be completely worn out. Kang Hajin grinned and said that he was unable to get up either. There are goblins all around him. If this is how they would die, Nuhan inquired. They had accomplished enough, in Kang Hajin's opinion. Saying that heroes pass away at a young age, Nuhan closed his eyes. It wasn't a bad life, he claimed. His eyes grew wide as he heard a sound. Glancing around, he saw that the goblins in their immediate vicinity were covered in ice. The voice informed Kang Hajin that they hadn't seen each other in a while and complimented Nuhan on a job well done. They were told to leave everything to the main character, who had a sword slung over his shoulder and to go relax. In the background of the main character was a throng of goblins frozen in ice, then throws open his arms and begins to shoot magic at the goblins. Nambung said that, in contrast to King Ghoul, it appears as though they have killed everyone as they stand on the road. Nuhan stood up and inquired as to how they arrived here without a car. The protagonist gestured toward the subway's descent. If they had left Cinch on station, Nuhan inquired. It should be teeming with goblins, he said. Nambung retorted that all of them had been killed. Nuhan affirmed, saying he didn't anticipate anything less from him. Jian Zhang and inquired as to when they would be going to his father's house. This was the plan, the main character retorted. Jian Zhang, raising an eyebrow, inquired as to whether he had brought up the possibility of purchasing an elixir in return for dungeon rewards. They don't have nearly 400,000 heads, he claimed. In response, Nambung stated that he never promised they could get 400,000 heads in the dungeon. Jian Zhang and was taken aback. Next inquired as to what prize he had taken from the dungeon. Nambung raised a book that had a purple aura surrounding it. The message box refers to the Book of Balansar. Grade, Best, Magic. A book written when the strange mage Balansar was younger. Exchange a random item for another. The grades of items can vary from common to uncommon. The grade of the original item has no bearing on the new item. The book is finished when it is used. Nuhan said that if you put material into the book, another item will be summoned after looking through it. He inquired as to the protagonist's interest in gambling, stated that it would be a waste to include an item in the book that is more rare than usual. Nambung declared that this was the book's secret as she raised the necklace above the text. Speaking, he fed the book a unique object. The book snapped closed, snatching the necklace that was inside. Book of Balansar has consumed a material, the dialogue box indicates, examining the rare quality of the material. Balansar's practical joke is now live. The light inside the book was a vivid purple glow. The book went from glowing yellow to white. The book of the Great Balansar is mentioned in the dialogue box. Grade, most elusive, best. An updated edition of the summoning book written by the young sage Balansar. You can obtain a higher grade item of the same type by offering one material. There are possible item grades ranging from epic to magic. The grade of the summoned item is one level higher than the grade of the material utilized. The summoning book is reduced to ashes after the summoning. Moon Hoon cried out in response to her raising the item's rarity. Nambung began discussing the kind of incredibly rare item they had. He cast a quick glance at Moon Hoon, who was staring at him startled and holding a sword. The protagonist took hold of the sword with both hands and inserted it into the book. He grimaced, Sword of Penifantanian appears in the dialogue box. Grade, greatest, epic. A freshly forged sword that Tanian, the executioner, made after melting down his own sword in a moment of self-repentance. The anger is no longer present, but the blood has solidified and seeped even further into the blade. Blood takes on a unique power when it comes into contact with the sword's blade. Nambung extended his blood-stained sword. He claimed that because it is epic rare, the sword, despite not having an ego of its own, appears to select its master. The dialogue box claims that the wielder's blood is being consumed by the sword. On the blade, mental energy is taking shape. The likelihood of taking control of a hunted monster is fixed. 
Nambung grinned and remarked that it was the ideal weapon for him. He claimed to be using necromancy, but he had not yet acquired a suitable weapon. Grinning, the main character answered, it's all because of him. Nambung claimed that he was the original owner of the sword. With his head scratched, he inquired as to the weapon he ought to wield at this moment. He was given a white sword by Nambung. Nambung gasped in shock to learn that all of the goblins had been frozen by the sword. He said he was interested in giving it a try. According to the main character, John Young picked him carefully because he knew this was going to happen. He continued by saying that he didn't accept it based solely on the name and didn't know anything about swordplay. Wordly questioned John Young about the 400,000 heads in the elixir. He believed that a second life was an illusion, just as he had previously believed. In response, the main character said there was no reason to worry. He claimed to have killed every goblin in Sinchon Station, earning him the moniker Goblin Ruler. The sword began to fade in his grasp. He claimed that he was able to access their storage because of this. Nambung claimed to have taken 550,000 heads from the bag of money he was holding. It was more than enough, he continued, to purchase an elixir. John Jung chuckled apprehensively and stated he didn't anticipate anything less from him. The protagonist instructed Ming Hun and Kang Ha Jin to attend the press conference after matters had essentially calmed down. Kang Ha Jin questioned why so abruptly. Nambung stated that the reporters would assemble here shortly once everything was back under control. He claimed that the other prophets had to remain unaware of his true identity for everything to go as planned. Talking to reporters would be less taxing than walking with them, he said, because they had been through a lot of battles and were tired. He asked them to do interviews while feigning prophetic abilities. Ling Hun grinned and gave him the thumbs up, saying he sent him to Sinchon first to give the impression that he was a prophet. He claimed he didn't think any less of him. Nambung frowned, realizing that they were drawing attention as he had intended. It was all going more smoothly than he had anticipated. He told them he was leaving it to them as he walked away, waving his hand at them. With their hands raised to their heads, Ming Hun and Kang Ha Jin instructed him to hand over the reporters to them. The main characters, Salmon and John Young, arrived in the hospital's dimly lit hallway. Nambung claimed that something was wrong because there shouldn't be such chaos, even if a few goblins were brought to the hospital in front of the army and police. John Young informed them that they needed to move quickly because his father was in the intensive care unit. Lead, the main character ordered. They bolted down the hospital hallway. The protagonist heard a cry for assistance and he turned to the side. He turned away, breaking off from the others. A girl was sitting on the floor at the end of the hallway, giving herself a self-hug. She enlisted aid. What had happened here and was she okay? Asked the main character. She retorted that the hospital was in disarray due to the appearance of some suspicious individuals. She said that after killing everyone, their heads were taken. A police officer with a grimace on his face lay lifeless on the ground. Nambung stated after taking a look at it that people, not goblins, were responsible. It's people who have the ability to return, the girl said. With an apologetic gesture, she offered him her hand and asked if he could get her up. She didn't have to apologize, the main character said, reaching out his hand in return. She gave him thanks. Nambung grabbed her wrist and jerked her up. Salmon and John Young sprint through the medical facility. Salmon asked if he had heard that after turning around. John Young claimed not to have heard anything. Upon noticing that the protagonist was missing from their group, she inquired as to his whereabouts. John Young claimed that this is his second life and that he most likely hurried off after remembering something crucial. He stated that they had to check on his father's health right away. Salmon pondered over the fact that she was weaker than John Young and that she couldn't simply leave him behind. She concurred. He was asked what he was doing by the girl. She claimed that it hurt and asked to be let go. There was a spiked gold ring on her finger. Regarding the fact that this is Shaken's needle, the main character inquired. He claimed that although it wasn't as deadly as the Red Hornet's venomous sting, it was still very potent against people. He claimed that it is clear what is causing the chaos in this hospital. Nambung leaped back as the girl swung the knife in front of her. She claimed to be able to trick both herself and other people. She inquired as to his comprehension. The main character answered that the dexterity rune he discovered in the dungeon helped him understand. She questioned why the runes were beginning to show up already. The girl stated that these are not basic items based on the information they were given. She grinned slightly and said that it was for the best. She said that because he had previously visited the dungeons, he ought to receive additional rewards, and she could benefit from this. With an eerie smile, the girl apologized a little since he was her kind of guy. She promised to remove them from his body. Nambung claimed that he didn't care about his wife at all and that only his wife was his type. With a furrowed brow, she inquired whether he had hurt her. With a sly smile, she flung herself at him holding a knife and threatened to kill him. Nambung grasped her wrist coolly, then he used his other hand to seize her wrist. The main character scowled coolly. He tossed it to her. She grinned as she said, I think he's something special, once she was upright. Would it really be so boring, she wondered. She continued by saying she was a little let down. 
The main character assumed he could handle her with ease, but he must consider how he comes across to the public. He reasoned that even though he was a horrible man, killing him would not yet have any positive effects. It helps, he continued, if someone is observing him. In his hand materialized a red sword. The girl, even after killing a number of goblins, clutched her knife and exclaimed in shock that it wasn't something you could just buy. Nambung rushed forward and declared that he would kill her without thinking twice because it was just the two of them. He reassured her that it would be as painless as possible and asked her not to worry. His sword swung. The girl had the knife above her head sliced in half. Her startled eyes grew wide. Chase Songa was like a baby lion cub with a natural gift for becoming the king of beasts in a world where the apocalypse is happening. A feral creature biding its time. Like any other mammal, a newborn lion cub is naturally curious, especially since it is a predator with a high level of intelligence. He is curious about new things and mocks them, seemingly to see how strong he is. But when he saw this, a feeling that was far more powerful than curiosity gripped him. Fear is this. A massive dinosaur staring down at the quivering lion cub was an overwhelming sensation that overpowers even a wild beast's instincts. A force that defies description with terms like might or strength. Something that perfectly embodies the traits of a mischievous newborn lion cub. The dinosaur let out a loud cry and opened its mouth wide. Total power derived from supernatural sources. The girl spun around in fear, believing that even if she deflected the blow, he would still cut her. She believed that if she didn't dodge, her body would move on its own to keep her alive. She took a bound. She considered the man to be a despot. She gave Namgung, who was standing there with a menacing expression, a tearful glance. To her, he appeared to be a massive dinosaur. His vacant eyes gave her the impression that he had gone completely insane. Fearing that she had gotten in touch with the wrong person, the girl gritted her teeth. She squeezed her eyes shut, thinking herself dead when she saw the sword approaching. Salmon yelled at the protagonist. He halted his sword. His startled eyes grew wide. Salmon was glancing about the enclosed space. The protagonist turned to face her. Jion Young, adding a grin, that his father was alright but they were missing the elixir. He began urging him to accompany them as soon as possible. Salmon questioned Namgung's actions after he saw him standing with a sword in front of Kisong Ah, who had collapsed to the ground. The protagonist remembered speaking with an old man sporting a mustache. With the light of the fire, they are seated in the woods. The man told him that if he could go back in time, he would never kill someone for no reason while holding up his index finger. He claimed that he creates enemies by murdering people. The man said, he should stand up to higher beings who want to see a world where people kill each other, pointing with his index finger at him. He declared that although Namgung, the godslayer, was a merciless godslayer, he was not a murderer. Namgung believed he had come dangerously close to killing a man in front of his daughter. He believed Clark could be correct. In response, the main character decided to give her a little scare because he thought she was attempting to steal the heads. Salmon expressed that she got it. Jai on Young and believed that he would not give up on frightening her. Namgung advised the girl to avoid him and not do anything similar the next time. He inquired as to her comprehension. She looked surprised but said she got it. On her leg, there was a distinct blue mark. She considered how his sword's force was the only thing that had broken her ankle. Jai on Young and asked them to head straight to his father's place. Namgung acknowledged and promised to return shortly. He found out the girl's name. Kisong Ah was her name, she retorted. As he walked away, the main character promised to remember. There's an ICU sign. They are in close proximity to the hospital bed that holds Jai on Young's father's body. Jai on Young and informed him that Namgung was brought. Namgung greeted him and expressed how nice it was to meet him. He made his introduction. The primary character took off Jai on Tiho's mask. He filled the man's mouth with the elixir. The elixir had a red hue. Jai on Tiho opened his eyes gradually. England Center for Disaster Response and Control. If Alec had seen the video on the internet, the girl asked. In response, he said he had noticed it through the window. He asserted that if it were true, Korea was home to two extraordinary individuals. The dark-skinned, bald man folded his arms and announced that the soldier was called Kang Ha Jin and had excellent skills. Was that the weapon he was using? The girl asked. She claimed that picking a weapon solely on the basis of information is very dangerous. She said that there's a good chance the other guy's sword is somewhere that the giant isn't carrying. In response, Alex said that the topics were supposed to vary depending on the prophet and the area. Spreading her hands, the girl said, this is nonsense, this is at least a rare item. Then a sword materialized in Alex's hand, and he declared that he too might be a prophet. According to him, the prophet in this instance is most likely the man standing next to Kang Ha Jin rather than him. He said, if he was a prophet like me, then it made sense why he used a special weapon, glancing at his reflection in the sword. He said they had to meet Kang Ha Jin if they wanted to meet him. The girl said that this was not their intention, but the public's attention is currently on Korea. Turning and frowning, Alex said he knew. He asserted that since only he is capable of saving them, all eyes should be on them and on him. 
She asked him what he was going to do with them while placing her hands on her belt. In response, Alex said he would make an effort to hire them, reasoning that it would be preferable to have them on his side before they joined the other prophets. She asked, scowling, what he would do if they said no. Calmly, Alec closed his eyes. With a menacing grin, he opened his eyes and informed them that they would need to trim the sprouts. Salmon surprised herself and parted her lips. The multi-story building was engulfed in flames and completely destroyed. Neumann cried out, saying he had no idea that, after dealing with Dusk, they would return and find the main character's house in such disarray. If they believed the goblins were responsible, he questioned them. Nimmon stated that it appears the actual landed in the incorrect coordinates based on the way one scolds the other and he bows apologetically. Salmon grabbed Yaksha by the hair and climbed onto his back. Neumann stated that, in addition to the cure, it appears that every Yaksha in the nation has arrived, unfortunately, at the main character's home. Nimmon claimed that everything was alright and that he had set up a shelter in case something similar occurred. Neumann inquired as to when he was able to get the shelter ready and whether the end of the world was the reason for it. Walking behind them, Salmon believes she hasn't slept at all and has been out and about all night. Nambung said he had it ready in case soldiers from North Korea launched an attack. Nimmon retorted that he was well prepared. There was a drop down in the ground beneath the heavy iron door. Salmon questioned whether they should live here after taking a disapproving look around. At least they have food and other supplies, according to Neumann. Taking out a red ball, the main character declared that modern architecture has a number of drawbacks that make it difficult for people to survive a post-apocalyptic disaster. He claimed that the building would be safer and more habitable if it were strengthened with the things that Jordan gave him. Goblin Stronghold Crystal, a crystal ball that forms a dwelling akin to a cave, is described in the dialogue box. The dwelling can be expanded by raising the rank. The protagonist's hands in the ball split in two, and a brilliant blue light started to glow. Goblin Stronghold, level 1's core is activating, the dialogue box says. A blue aura filled the space, transforming the shelves into wooden ones and forming a tree stump with a candle in the center of it. A wooden structure with four stumps stood in front of them. The ceiling gave way a little. The dialogue box indicates that the construction of the Goblin Stronghold is finished. After the rank is raised, expansion becomes available. Salmon's face twisted in annoyance as she looked up. Nambun claimed it was only momentary. He declared that if he builds a stronghold, it will transform into a haven that can keep them safe. He considered how, in his past life, he had never seen it. Moonhoon said, I'm cool, with a nervous smile. Salmon asked when they planned to leave this place. The protagonist believed that after glancing at the phone, Alec ought to have gotten in touch with Kang Hodgam by now. Group 8 Martial Stars was written on his phone's screen. Denhol, Roxane, Mikhail, Alec Trauman, and era Michelle Ninagawa Eri. Nambung said that he must move quickly to begin his plan. There's a plane in the sky. On the plane is Alec and his group. Someone called. When Alec answered the phone, he saw that it was ringing from an unknown number. Was it Kang Hodgam? The girl inquired. Ignoring her, Alec waved her away. He was informed by the phone voice that the prophet of the fog's pathfinder had his eye on him. He cautioned him to use caution. With a scowl, Alec let out a surprised cry. Surprised, he glanced at his phone. He considered the fog's pathfinder. He reasoned that his higher being's knowledge should indicate that providence should be his ability. Alex believed that it was a capability that allowed one to see into the future. Though he probably wasn't able to utilize it to its fullest yet, he felt that it was an overly powerful ability. If this call's contents were accurate, Alec reasoned, Pathfinder's prophet already knew he was on his way to Korea. He shouted to Johanna. She answered, resting her hand over her face. He requested that she reschedule their meeting with Kang Hodgam. He stated, beaming, that he had to alter the future. Nambung said that Alec could try torturing his brain for ideas as much as he wanted, phone in hand. He claimed that it was already in his hand's palm. Nambung asked who he was calling as he peered out of the bunker. He said that three hours later, at Uido, 63 Square, Alec had requested a change in the meeting's time and location. The main character claimed to have informed him that Dingawa Erika was keeping an eye on him. Nambung questioned if he had spoken to her as well. Nambung turned around and responded that although there was nothing in this life that brought them together, it was crucial to convince Alec that she was present. He claimed that Alec was reserved and mistrusted others. He clarified that he was simply exploiting his mental flaws and exploring them further. Nambung went on to say that he would make Erika come here. He predicted that she would want to come here at all costs once she saw the future they had built. Nambung instructed Moonhoon to carry out the plan, stating that he would move first. Moonhoon nervously swallowed. What would happen if the three prophets got together in Korea? He questioned. In response, the main character said that nothing would happen and that they would defend Korea and their territory, beginning at the second entrance of hell. What would they do till then? Someone inquired of Alec. With their bags in tow, they strolled through the airport. 
In response, he said they would survey the 63 square meters and prepare. The dark-skinned, balding man asked if they could first have a snack, saying he was hungry. He continued by saying that when one is full, everything improves. Hannah inquired as to where he got the expression. In response, Hansen said that was an old Korean proverb and that he had lived in Korea before. As there was a good chance of a fight, Alex suggested having a snack. He recommended visiting a steakhouse with a Michelin rating. He continued by saying that he wasn't positive if Korea had one. Johnson maintained that you have to get a first-hand look at the local cuisine culture when traveling. He waved as he stood by the taxi, telling them to follow him since he knew where he was going. Hannah let out a sigh and instructed him to keep his mind on the mission rather than filling his belly. What could one eat in a country this small? She asked me. She went on to say that since they had entered hell, everything had to be broken. They discovered themselves standing in front of a broken sign. Hannah claimed to be aware of it. Harrison retorted that the location was only 40 years old. Seated around a table, Josephine turned to face Alec, who assured her that no one would take her food away and that she should eat slowly. Jason claimed to have learned how to eat appetizing food. With a raised eyebrow, Alex examined the kimchi on his fork before expressing his distaste. Hannah commented, It seems like Koreans eat kimchi every day, with a sparkle in her eyes. She instructed him to eat kimchi with radishes and a spoonful of galbai soup right away. She grabbed Alex's head and started shoving kimchi into his mouth. With a smile, Hansen declared that he was already infatuated with Korean cuisine. They still had time before they met with Kang Ha Jum, so he suggested that they explore the area more. Hannah nodded and gave him the order to lead them. Wearing traditional Korean attire, Johanna stands in front of a mirror in a clothing store. Jason gives her the thumbs up from behind. In a restaurant, they consume meat. A man wearing a red apron and a sword places a plate on their table. Two fingers are visible in the photo of Johanna as they sit on the grass. They stroll along the city street in the evening. She reported having fun today. According to Johanna, Korea is simply incredible. Even though they have passed through the gates of hell, their cities continue to operate like any other. She claimed that it was incomprehensible in light of the existence of a prophet. Unlike her usual rough demeanor, Alec noticed that she was actually rather soft today. He inquired as to her level of liking for the nation. Hannah, perplexed, rushed forward and announced that they needed to head to the meeting spot as it was almost time. Jason chuckled, and Alex concurred. It is getting dusk in the city. A girl dressed in customary Japanese attire peers out the window. She asked the man standing behind her, Namgum, if he was the regressor that her higher self, the Fog Pathfinder, had mentioned. She gave him a serene glance. She addressed him by name as the main character gave her a serious look. Gazing out the window, Alex strolls down the hallway. He claimed that it was impossible for outsiders to meddle and that it was impossible to be ambushed at this altitude. Myeonghan couldn't fool him, he claimed. He was informed that they could be tapped through the headset in his ear. The voice warned them to hang up and wait at the appointed spot because he might be being watched at the moment. After agreeing, Alec removed the gadget from his ear. He turned around to see who had called out to him from behind. Kang Hajin approached him and gave his name. Reaching out, Alec told him he appeared larger than in the video. Despite the changes to their meeting, he thanked him for attending. Kang Hajin said it wasn't an issue and disregarded his hand as he passed by. Alec questioned whether he was aware of his moon vision ability. This ability informs you of your opponent's power level. He reasoned that if he was aware of this ability, he would also be aware of the others and that he had possibly employed Johnson and Hannah by using the sun's light to locate and hire them. He turned to watch him leave, thinking that he might be hiding something nearby too if he was truly aware of Johnson and Johanna's existence. Alec reasoned that he needed to keep his composure because this was just a guess. He put his hands in his pockets and expressed surprise that Korea had defended its territory so successfully when even England, which shared his profit, had suffered significant losses. He turned to face them and thanked them for everything. He inquired as to how they had killed the magical beings in Shinchun. In response, Kang Hajin expressed his flattery and thanked the town's residents for coming to the aid of the police, army, and other emergency personnel. In response, Alex said he didn't have to be so modest because he had come to speak with someone with his level of expertise. In response, Kang Hajin said that he then advised him to speak with someone else. With a quick flick of his thumb, he revealed that he also obtained his weapon from him. The 60th floor was reached by the elevator. Moon Hoon appeared behind the doors as they opened. With a smile on his face, Alec realized that he had anticipated exactly this. He introduced himself, putting out his hand. Moon Hoon chuckled, scratched the back of his head, and introduced himself, stating that although he was now retired, he had previously served with Kang Hajin's squad. Alec considered how he appeared ready and that he was also avoiding shaking hands. 
he concluded that he could now be certain that they were aware of his abilities. With a smile, Alec explained that his extraordinary movements were expected of a soldier. He went on to say that he is not at all like a typical actor. Moonhoon smiled back, saying that the prophets would not have surfaced if a global celebrity like Alec hadn't disseminated the information about them on the news. If that meant he was a prophet himself, Alec questioned. Moon Hoon retorted that he wasn't sure if the man was an ally or an enemy, so he couldn't tell him everything just yet. After a brief pause, Alec grinned and nodded. He asserted that a leader's uncertainties are crucial. Moon Hoon grinned back, saying that he spoke only wise words as one might expect. He expressed his belief that he would comprehend being so giving. With a serene expression, he mentioned the Catholic St. Mary's Hospital and the Noryongjin Station. Moon Hoon stated that he thought he understood how to select the ideal seats. Alex's surprised eyes grew wide. Even though he was a Pathfinder's prophet, his abilities had to be limited. He reasoned as he considered how he knew that Hannah and Harrison were waiting for him. A prophet such as he was should be aware that the world was in danger, he growled. Clutching his fist, Alec declared that they must come together and that he must determine whether or not he possessed prophetic abilities. He yelled that humanity must follow modern firearms as their usefulness is quickly approaching its end. Declaring that the prophets were the only ones capable of rescuing the planet, Alec yelled that he was going to establish an international union. He yelled that his sole purpose for coming here was to invite him to accompany him and present him to his allies. With his arms extended and his breathing heavily, Alec stood. King Hajin gave him a quiet glance. If this was true, Moon Hoon inquired. He claimed that he didn't feel like saving humanity, he just wanted to play hero. With a nervous laugh, Alec inquired as to what he was discussing. Moon Hoon claimed that although he uses poetic language to express his ideas, his true goal is to unite all states in an alliance and seize global dominance. With a nervous lift of the eyebrow, Alec inquired as to whether he could sense his intentions. Moon Hoon inquired, if he could, the sword materialized in Alec's grasp. Moon Hoon was sternly called out by King Hajin. He shot forward, shoving it out of the way of the dazzling, dark energy stream. Moon Hoon, who was clenching his teeth tensely, felt the flow of energy cut his cheek. This was why the powers of foresight were so unpleasant, Alec said, his face grim. He said he really didn't want him to prove to be the most accurate prophet of prophecy of the seven. Shrouded in a sinister aura, he approached them and declared that if he spared his life, he would only serve as a hindrance to achieving his objective. Moon Hoon stirred and stood. Moon Hoon was told to die here by Alec, who was radiating a blue aura and had a dislike on his face. Nambung spent the entire evening telling Erika that it had been a while since they had last seen one another. She said that they appeared to have known one another in a past life as a return favor. He inquired as to her opinion of the future he had imagined. Erika remained silent. Nambung claimed that Moon Hoon is feigning to be the Pathfinder prophet and that he is dating Alec Trauman. He claimed that Alec would prefer Moon Hoon to perish, or, to put it more accurately, the prophet of the Fog's Pathfinder. Nambung threatened to approach Erika and attempt her murder if he discovered that she was the true Pathfinder of the Fog's prophet and not Moon Hoon. He claimed that because he is a regressor and does not possess the abilities of Providence, she is forced to join forces with a man by the name of Nambung before Alec shows up. He wondered if she had visited Korea after giving it some thought. Yes, Erika replied. She would have to follow his rules, the main character said, but she swallowed her pride and went. She was wise, he said. Erika concurred and said she could take a quick look at the future even though she didn't remember it as well as he did. Nambung raised his phone and saw that Moon Hoon had called. She is going to kill the prophet of the Pathfinder of the Fog, according to Alec's voice on the phone. Is this how the future looks like? Inquired the main character. Erika was asked by Moon Hoon if she had heard. He whispered into his jacket that he knew that Alec would kill her. Alec gave him a startled look. Behind him, a massive human silhouette materialized. He struck him with a massive fist, knocking Alec aside in the process. He slowed down with his sword and inquired as to when he would be in time. There is nothing to recognize here, declared a massive man with a beard and a shaved head who was wearing a red jacket and a t-shirt featuring an intimidating picture of Erica. He claimed that knowing that Erika's enemies must be eliminated was all that was necessary. Angry that Moon Hoon had been duped, Alec turned around and yelled at him. Moon Hoon grinned and said, I never told him that I could use Providence. He said that after he threw the bait, he was taken in. Angry, Alec demanded to know what he had said. The man warned him not to become sidetracked after giving him a punch to the stomach. He squatted on the ground, trembling, and considered how this blow would have killed a regular person. He questioned how Erika was able to command such a creature. Gritting his teeth, he considered the possibilities of whether Moon Hoon was a fake person named Erika or if they were actually under Erika's authority and not a prophet. The man asked Alec if he had just thought of Erika as he turned to face him, his eyes red with rage. He warned him not to even consider thinking about Erika, slapping his fist. Ambung claimed that Alec Trauman had different goals in mind, adding that while everyone aspires to have this, very few people are able to fulfill it. 
In this sense, he claimed, Alec Trauman is unique. According to him, once the carnival starts, the observer of the sun and moon bestows the greatest benefits to its prophet among the eight supreme beings, pretending to be a fully human, omnipotent being in order to satisfy human desire. But the true desire of the sun and moon observer is to see a monastery full of avaricious people, and Alec Trauman was picked to appease his perverted taste. Erica questioned Nambung about his ability to distinguish himself from Alec. She explained that, to the extent that he already knew, her ability to see into the future was still limited, and she required confirmation from far-off future events that she was unable to predict. Erica stated that she required assurances that he would not betray her or bring about the extinction of the human race. In response, the main character said that this was a ridiculous question. He claimed that she was genuinely curious about what would happen if she didn't follow the regressor wrapped in a dark red energy. A fist approached and Alec looked at it. He squatted down and yelled that he had no idea who Erica was. He held the sword firmly, radiating energy. Sword swinging forward, Alec lunged at him. A jet of energy shot through the concrete pillar behind the man as he ducked. According to Alex, it was fairly quick for a human. The man retorted that he could not be compared to an actor who makes everything look fake because he was a natural killer. If he believed his actions were acting, Alec inquired. The man's eyebrow went up. Alec quickly caught up to him and apologized if that was the case. With his face down, he claimed that SLSS was where he learned his moves rather than Hollywood. He scowled gravely, emanating a blue aura. With a surge of energy, Alec swung his sword forward. It was perceived by Kim Hyun Jin and Kang Ha Jin as an assassin team that was dissolved a few years prior. With a raised eyebrow, Kang Ha Jin advised Mim Hun to assist Igor. Where had he been looking all this time? Mim Hun inquired. He instructed him to gaze at Igor. Could he see his fighting spirit? He inquired. Igor escaped Alex's swinging sword. Igor turned around and, looking scared, asked for assistance. Mim Hun grinned and explained that he had only instructed them to move out of the way. He said that since it was a fight between two men, they ought to let Igor have fun. In response, Kang Ha Jin said he understood. Nim Hun claimed to be a tough guy who will be remembered for using only his hands to defeat the prophet. Igor screamed that he needed assistance while cursing angrily. They nodded awkwardly, and suddenly they were holding weapons. Swearing, Alex swung his sword. He commanded them all to perish and unleashed a stream of energy with a single swing of his sword. Igor fried, gritting his teeth. With his sword, Nim Hun stopped the energy's flow but it sliced through the hands of Kang Ha Jin and the Tanfa, knocking Igor back as a cloud of dust billowed behind them. With his shirt collar adjusted, Alec reported that he had seen a different sword online and that Mim Hun had been able to block Galaxy's sword. He claimed that he could not purchase weapons comparable to the sword his higher being had bestowed upon him. He inquired as to who had given him the sword, Eric or his higher self. Mim Hun paused and scowled. Alec stated that he had no choice but to refuse to respond. He told Mim Hun to die and stated that one was sufficient for questioning. Mim Hun considered how he made a deal with Nambung and borrowed the sword to appear to be a prophet, so it can't control it. His body was covered in red veins, and he asked if he would shout again while glancing at the sword. Mim Hun turned to the comrade who had previously been a decapitation sword, enveloped in a red aura. Ignoring what it was, Alec stared in shock at the swirl of red energy. He grimaced. Mim Hun fired red energy at him while swinging his sword. Sword swinging in front of him, Alec cut through it. With a tonfa, Kang Ha Jin materialized in front of his face. He scowled and struck him with his gritted teeth. According to Kang Ha Jin, SL's is not at all like that. Taking his tonfa in his hand, Alex stated that he didn't think any less of an active worker. He asked if he could fight three SL opponents while scowling. Kang Ha Jin inquired about the three, looking surprised. Hannah reappeared behind him, her expression solemn. She gave him a back of the head punch. Niam Hun got a slap across the face from Hansen. They dropped to the ground. Hansen advised them to make a quick retreat. He offered to leave and declared that their escape route was ready. Alex stated that they needed to complete the task before leaving. He said that in order to give them to whoever planned this, he needed to chop off their heads. Jason claimed to know a large man. He claimed to be employed by the Russian assassination group Zakat. He claimed that whoever had planned this would be far more powerful than him if he assisted them, and that if they killed him, they might incite them. Alexander scowled and inquired if he desired to inform him that he ought to feel fearful. Johnson began arguing that wasn't true. A hand caught his nape firmly. Hannah expressed surprise when she realized she had indeed struck him in the C3 vertebrae. How did he get up? She wondered. Nim Hun fell to the ground and began to laugh. Grinning, he said that, being an ogre, it meant nothing to Kang Ha Jin. With a menacing expression, Kang Ha Jin was tightly gripping Harrison's neck. Hannah inquired about the ogre, looking surprised. Did that imply that it had a secret endowment? She questioned. Mim Hun grinned and declared that he had always been that way, the finest of all mammals, a human being superior to all other humans. Set aside, Kang Ha Jin Hansen. 
Hannah noticed that he was focusing the blood flow in his muscles after witnessing him toss Johnson against the wall. She scowled and said, he was very strong. There it was, a whip in her hands. A whip made of the tail of the nine-tailed fox, the dialogue box says. She yelled that she had the upper hand when it came to fighting skills and struck out with her whip. Kang Ha Jin used his hands to deflect her blow. He took hold of her whip and began to tug on it. Hannah's eyes grew wide with astonishment. Kang Ha Jin gave her a hard slap on the face. She collapsed to the floor. Kang Ha Jin was taken aback to discover that there was no effect. Hannah materialized behind him, her expression menacing. She encircled his neck with her arms. With a start, Mam Hun realized that she had just avoided Kang Ha Jin's blow. Hannah clenched her teeth and kept strangling him. According to Mam Hun, being SLs is more than just having superior fighting skills. He claimed that she detected all of the ogre's vulnerabilities and quickly stopped the blood flow by applying a chokehold. He questioned how Alec had managed to hire someone with such talent as he stood up. He claimed he had to take action. Hannah was told by Alec to hold it while he cut it in half. He made a sword swing in front of him. He was thwarted by Mam Hun, who materialized in front of him. In a rage, Alec questioned how he got up and whether he would start talking gibberish once more. With a chuckle, Mam Hun said, persistence. His eyes brightened a little. With a furious swing of his sword, Alec yelled at him to stop talking. He yelled that he was abhorred by him. Mam Hun laughed and said that although he wasn't good, it wouldn't be enough to make him give up. With a fierce swing of his sword, Alec yelled at him to cease his conversation. Mam Hun repeatedly thwarted his attacks. Observing his quivering hands, Mam Hun surmised that he had only sparred a few blows with the prophet before his hands had become unbearably trembling. All he did, like a coward, was block, Alec sneered. Where had his perseverance gone, he asked. Without Nambung's spirit magic, Mam Hun considered how he would never be able to fully resonate with sword spirits. The fact that he was able to advance this far with someone else's sword seemed miraculous to him already. He frowned, realizing that he couldn't defeat Alec despite how unpleasant it was. He considered the fact that he could only buy more time until the point that Nambung had indicated. Alec yelled at him to accept his fate and give up on his wish to live as they crossed swords. Something interrupted them, a cry for assistance. Turning, they faced the voice. Hannah was hanging on his back against the wall when Kang Hajin slammed her. She closed her eyes, believing that if she let go, this monster would kill them all. She made a request for assistance. Kaming Hajin stood up. With fear, Alec and Mim Hun turned to face them. Johanna collapsed to the ground. She did a fantastic job, Harrison told her as he embraced her. Nam Hun questioned him about his resurrection. With a smile, he explained that his well-trained body wouldn't break easily. He considered how he was merely bluffing despite being in great pain. In response, Mim Hun said he was shocked but also stronger. Hansen claimed that his Korean was even worse than his own when a steel glove materialized on his hand. He explained that it was because he was using all of his energy on it and that he ought to have saved some for a brain like his. With orange energy radiating from the muzzle, he extended his fist. To use high tech like him, he instructed. The dialog box reads magic, best, boom blaster, grade. A gauntlet made by the magic engineering nation, Alcester Republic, for use by attack troops. Behind Alec, there was an explosion. Kang Hajin was called out by Mim Hun. With a sword wave, Alec questioned how he could have forgotten about it. Mam Hun turns his gaze to the energy. Alec's sword is dripping blood onto the ground. He says, it's over, to the standing Hannah and Harrison behind him. In front of them lie Kang Hajin and Mim Hun on the floor. Alec ordered them to decapitate the two Koreans and remove the Russian outlaw so he could be questioned. As promised, Alec assured Hansen that he would not immediately kill the Zakat man. If he was satisfied with it, he inquired. Hansen concurred. Hannah swore and declared that she believed her back would split in two. With a menacing expression, she grasped the whip and requested permission to murder Kang Hajin. She threatened to split his back in two. Mim Hun sent them on their way to hell. Alec furrowed his brow. The room was lit by a blue light, and the floor started to vibrate. Alec inquired as to the situation. He gave a startled spin around. He grimaced. Monsters the size of lizards were dropping out of the sky. Monsters were descending from the sky when a massive blue eye opened. Hell's second gate opened. Alec cursed. It was almost time for everyone to see that the second carnival had begun. Many lizards were falling from the sky. The people who were watching were all waiting for what was going to happen. The mission was to stay alive, of course. The man looked away at the other man. He told Alec that the phone was ringing for Alec to pick it up. Alec immediately picked up the phone and asked what the man wanted from him. Alec was clearly annoyed that he'd gotten the call. Was it really Erica's who'd called him? Alec said that he would definitely find him, that when he found him, he would be dead. Our main character clearly made it clear that Alec will only do what he wants if he can survive, so our protagonist advised him to hurry up or not say hello. 
Alec clearly knew that our hero knew everything, and his face showed resentment or anger it was impossible to say for sure. But our main character, looking at the floor, told his interlocutor that he must kill as many monsters as possible for his own safety. If he does well, he will become not only the defender of England, but also the whole of Korea. Alec immediately threw his phone out onto the floor. He started shouting for everyone to be killed. He knew that he didn't care about the sunset, he only wanted to actually kill as many monsters as possible. The people who were close to him agreed with his plan, but then something happened that no one expected, or rather, a charge flew through one of the windows. He almost hit the girl who was standing near the eye. Alec didn't understand if the shot from below had gone straight to their floor, or if Namgoon had hired someone with an archery skill. But while Alec was thinking, another arrow came flying, which also missed him. Alec decided that it was time to run, he realized that they were not in a very favorable position, that they should retreat. The girl who was also almost shot turned to Kang, who was told that he was really lucky to be released so easily. Two guys started talking, were they both okay? A certain girl appeared in front of us and said that she thought so, that due to the early closing of the first gate of hell, the opening time of the second one had changed. But even so, had he been able to foresee the future? But our Prias had replied that he did not just remember the future, he was also able to acquire various opportunities that were not available to others. He immediately turned to Erica and said that she also knew that after the first gate of hell, there were dungeons all over the mainland. But did he talk about the ghoul king? After all, in Japan, the same dungeon was also cleaned up. Our protagonist replied that it was exactly like that, that all over the world people were coming up with dungeons. He said that the gates of hell have a special opening condition. That when all the continent's dungeons are cleared, the second gate opens. Our character told the girl that Japan was the last one, that it was Erika's presence there that meant that the cleanup was complete. It was our hero who timed the meeting so that it coincided with the opening of the gate. Erika, looking at our little protagonist, made a serious face, she realized that Tom does not need to look into the future, that he already knows everything. Our character, noticing her facial expression through the veil, asked not to be so careful, because in any case, the current life goes a completely different way. As for the opening time of the gate, he was just lucky. Our main character began to say that only past life experience helps him act as he does now, that predicting the future is much stronger than simple memories. The girl, realizing what the man in front of her was driving at, asked, so what does he want? The character replied that it was nothing out of the ordinary, he only asked to close the second gate with him, that he had managed the first one alone, but now this is impossible. Erica, noticing his agitation, suggested that most likely the stations and airports would be closed, but still said that she agreed that now they would make their move. While the girl was talking about this, another person appeared behind her. He said his name was Katsumata. Our protagonist immediately recognized this person. He knew that this was the head of Soaring Moon, but I can't know for sure that he will arrive in Korea. Erika, on the other hand, said with an obvious grin on his face that when you don't know if the person who returned to the past will be a friend or an enemy, it would be to come alone. Our character replied that this was a wise thing to do, but still ask us to get down to business, or rather to explain the plan for getting into the second gate. He started saying that I didn't worry about the gates of hell in the first place. The guy asked, is this really a joke? But our character replied that there are actually people who will take care of the demons coming out of the gate. But many may wonder, but won't there be a boss? Of course, the world boss will not appear from the gates of hell. Our protagonist was asked, then where will he come from? Our main character immediately asked to look outside, because that's where the boss will appear. Everyone, looking there, realized that now the boss will appear. So it happened, a certain snake appeared from there. The second boss from the gates of hell, a monster that swallowed all the world's oceans. It was incredibly huge. Our main protagonist replied that despite the fact that it is simply huge, it is possible to kill it. Our hero replied that snake-like demons have a common weakness, or rather, the inverted wrath of the king scale. They asked him, because if you just need to destroy it, then there is nothing easier. Our protagonist said that if this is the case, then the weapon will not be of a rare rank, or higher, it will not even be possible to scratch. The girl said that as far as he knew, only Alec Tramon had such a weapon. Our protagonist understood that he would get too much recognition for defeating the serpent. The guy asked, is our hero really going to steal the sword from him? Our main character said that this is not a bad way, but it will not even be necessary. At the same time, the window to the building where all the people were sitting. Everyone was shocked, because what was it? How is this even possible? But after looking outside, everyone noticed that a certain archer had fired a sword from a bow. Of course, our protagonist knew that his foresight didn't work so well, but it was still a good job, judging by the fact that he was handed Myung Hoon's weapon in order. He prepared a sword that could hit the wrath of the king. It remains only now to prepare one person, or rather the leader of the Soaring Moon, Katsumata. Time after time, multiple spears began to hit the building. 
our hero said that now they just have to see what Parisha Luna is capable of. Our protagonist said that they don't need such things unnecessarily. While Katsumato was leaving, Owen asked to keep an eye on Erika. Katsumato was getting further and further away at this moment, and he immediately jumped on the lizard. He bit into its scales, and then noticed something strange, that our hero was right in front of him. Of course, he realized that it was very difficult for him to resist on these scales, because they are quite slippery. Our character also said that rushing will only ruin it, that it's better to just make him angry for now. Katsumata couldn't understand what our main character was talking about, but at the same time, a blow was delivered directly to the snake. The snake started screaming and twirling, and Katsumata couldn't understand what was happening to our main character. Our hero also realized that this is just a small sacrifice for the common good. But our main character said that it's better to be eaten than killed. The snake continued to make faces, while our main character made it clear that he could absorb five oceans. The serpent moved, smashing the bridge that was under it until Katsumata could barely hold onto his swords. Now the snake was able to swallow Katsumata open mouth. Katsumata shouted that he was very scared, and then he threw his shuriken right so that it caught on the lizard's tooth. Our main character says that his partner is not bad but Katsumata only asked him to help until the lizard's mouth closed. Our protagonist said that we really should hurry up before he does. Katsumata, who was hanging from the lizard's tooth, so our Paris Nash had no choice but to cut the rope. Katsumata screamed in fear, but there was nothing left but to fly further into the lizard's mouth. By that time, many of Alex's squad were fighting against the lizards, and she knew that no matter how many kills she killed, there was no end in sight. The bald man even shouted that the goblins were on a different level, that they didn't just die like that. But Alec wasn't so disappointed that they weren't working out, and he used his sword to start slicing his way through. People who noticed Alec knew that everything was too serious, that vice was vice. The guy who had a scar on his left eye. All he could think about was that the humanoid lizards were all so neatly resolved. Alec must have been very tired dealing with them. The man who helped bring it said that he gave the sword to Tatiana Koenig, so if he ran into Alec this time, he would definitely die. How should he move on now and avoid running into them? people started talking about how he was fine with the short break, that they could continue now. But what surprised them was that there were too many lizards. We thought that Ken and he had to hand over the sword and deal with what was happening nearby. They knew they should head straight for the tower, but how did they know where Kenan was? This group, passing further and further, decided to find a car, but the bald man was busy with something else. He was looking at the fact that there were about 63 lizards in the square, so he requested a car from the tower to show that you only need to go one block. People were shocked, because did he contact Koenig? They knew that they had to find Alec as soon as possible, because if he met Namjoon or Kenan, he would definitely want to kill them. But the lizards were already attacking from above, and the man grabbed his sword and tried to freeze all the lizards. The lizards were successfully frozen, the man was happy about it, but for some reason one of the lizards started moving, it wasn't frozen. He almost attacked one of the people, but was immediately eliminated with an arrow. It was a guy with glasses, or rather Kenan. That's how this video ends. If you have sat through to the end, please don't forget to press the subscribe button and leave feedback. See you in the next video.